Good evening, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, I'd like to open up the uh, call to order the uh, June 12th, 630 public hearing to, or, um, to order. This public hear hearing is for Council Order 2023-009, Utility Grant of Locations, National Grid Gas, Willard Street, um, Furnace Ave, and Rusciutti Drive. So at this point, I would like to ask uh, anyone wishing to speak in favor or opposition to come to the podium, state your name and address. If you do not wish to speak but would like your support or opposition recorded, please sign in on the sheet on the, on the table at the back of the chamber. So at this time, is there anybody who would like to speak in favor or against? Come to the podium. Okay. Um, see, um, I'm going to reach out to. Does anyone on the council like to speak to it? Okay. Um, it, it, um, the reason why I asked for that is because uh, with the activity and the hopes of some traffic mitigation uh, at that location. Uh, more than likely tonight, uh, and I'm not more than likely tonight, it will not be coming out of committee. So that me moving on, um, it's 6.32. We have another public hearing at 6.35. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. We're back. Um, I'd like to call to order the June 12th, 635 public hearing to order. This is a public hearing for council order 2023-054 utility grant of location Verizon Old Colony Ave at Bale Street. At this point, I would like to add, again, I'd like to ask anyone wishing to speak in favor or opposition to come to the podium, state your name and address. If you do not wish to speak but would like to uh, your support or opposition recorded, please sign in on the sheet uh, on the table at the back of the chamber. So is there anybody who's uh, looking to speak uh, in favor or against uh, the grant of location at Old Colony Ave and Bill Street? Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, seeing not uh, further public comment, I will close this hearing at 636. We will be returning back in four minutes um, for the beginning of the Finance Committee meeting. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting of the, of the Quincy City Council Finance Committee meeting to order and ask the clerk to read the roll. Councilor Andronico. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Devine. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Council Mahoney, Present. Council McCarthy, Present. Chairman Phelan. Present. Nine members. Nine quorum. members, we have a quorum. Uh, I'm going to read into the, the, the record the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or a video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and per permissible. Okay, at this point we're gonna start with the, we, we have kind of a busy agenda, so we're gonna jump right into it. Um, we're gonna start with the first item on the agenda, 2023-046, Appropriation General Fund Non-Union Employee Salary Increases. Um, do we, at this point, does any, is there a presentation right? Okay. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open it up to the city councils with questions. Any councils with questions on the on the pay raises? Oh, Council Andronico. Uh, this might be best directed for you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Walker. Um, if this is part of a, a phased approach. From the administration, or is, if this is a one-time shot, or what can we expect? Through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, this is a phased approach uh, for most of the positions included. 
uh, in the non-union positions. There are some where the increase will be broken up over two years, and there are some where the increase was an amount that it'll, it'll be just one year. Um, roughly, any increase that was uh, in the range of about $10,000, um, that was going to be covered in one year. And then anything beyond that was broken into two years. Okay. So anything above 10000 was broken into multiple years? That is correct, Council. Okay. Okay, Council's on the uh, issue before us. Council, Council Mahoney? Um, when you did the presentation back in, I think it was April 24th, it was Gardner and Mr. Mason. Is Mr. Mason here tonight? Um, how come we didn't have the HR director um, presenting as well? I think from a general standpoint, A, the administration is, is one entity. Um, we work as a team. Um, this process was initiated via municipal finance um, because it's relative to money. Um, but there was coordination and discussion um, you know, with the full team. Um, throughout the process. So when you say it was discussed with the full team and you were going through all of the salaries and all of the, the job descriptions and then you were doing the comparison, was there any scrutiny to some of the job descriptions because they were, um, they weren't apples to apples in other communities? Through you, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, the consultant did its work um, based upon the review that it was taking place and there was there are not necessarily apples to apples in every other community. The consultant did uh, the best it possibly could, um, drilling down into those areas and then getting to uh, that area where it was certainly uh, the comparatives, the comparisons made sense. Okay. And then there are jobs that are not in the current budget, like we discussed it during the budget, um, such as um, I'm not sure what the title is, communication director, a communication director that was being paid out of Comcast. Is that also included? Is that salary also included as a bump up? Through you, Mr. Chairman, those aren't part of the operating budget. There are always jobs that are outside of the operating budget. Um, yeah, they would be included um, through whatever funding mechanism those jobs are. It's, um, as the body knows, that there are, there are a number of positions um, throughout the city that are not general fund mm -hmm. uh, positions, uh, and those would be implicated in the same way as the general fund positions. So um, positions that are being funded through OPERA, which is close to $700,000 um, of OPERA funds, is, is funding uh, multiple jobs. Those, those jobs are also included um, in, the, in the increase, correct? Correct. And that OPERA will not be around for, through the audit, through you to the auditor. How long is OPERA, the OPERA funds going to be able to be used for? It, could you repeat the question, sorry? For the opera funds, how, how much longer do we have? Is it through 2025 that we'll be able to use the opera funds uh, for I'm salary? assuming that you can use them, you'll use them obviously till the funds are, are, are finished. Okay. However, I think they can go to 2025, I'm not sure. Yeah, and I think the last time I reviewed the ARPA funds, we were pretty much um, all encumbered without the new ESTER funds that were being placed into the opera funds that are going to be used for the um, Richter Christopher school building. So I guess I'm concerned about that. That's another 700,000 that could be offset into our general fund budget at some point. Um, and the reason why I bring this up, because one of those job titles, and I just want to read this for people at home, um, is called the Director of Institutional Relations. And that job summary says, the Director of Institutional Relations is responsible for developing and maintaining positive relationships between the city of Quincy and institutions and organizations within the community, including colleges and universities, hospitals and cultural institutions. Key responsibilities include identifying partnerships, opportunities, developing strategies, and engaging with stakeholders and representing the city um, community events and meetings. I think that job's going up. I could be wrong, but I, I think that's going up. Do you, do you know how much that one's going up? Uh, that, that position no longer exists, Councilor. Oh, since when? Because it was, uh, it, was I, the, uh, it was in the opera funds recently. Sure. Uh, we're here talking about the general operating budget. I can find out for you 
when that that position was eliminated? No, we're here talking about salary increases, which are in the general operating budget, but this is also part of it because those increases are also there. And I just want to call it, whether or not it doesn't exist or doesn't, it had existed. We were paying this person. They're paying $130,000 to this person. We do not have, we have two colleges in the city of Quincy. We have Eastern Nazarene College and we have Quincy College, all of which have about maybe 1,400 students complete. In the city of Boston, they have 35 colleges. In Boston Direct, and they have 152,000 students. They don't have anybody like this. We don't have a hospital in the city of Quincy, and I don't think we had any reports ever prepared for um, or presented to city officials with regards to this position. The reason why I'm bringing this up, though, is because there are multiple positions that are not in the operating budget that are being paid for from other other places. That makes our budget not transparent. And although it's an operating budget, when you have salaries and you're paying health care, here, that's also in our operating budget, and we're paying these people health care. It's not transparent. What we could do is we could have an offset in the budget, just like we do for Discover Quincy, which is in the budget, the operating budget, but it's offset through the hotel motel. So I'm just pointing this out to the taxpayers at home to explain and maybe educate people as to why, not only with all of the money that we bond, why your taxes are going up, but also because there are a lot of positions, 700,000 of them, worth of them in the ARPA funds that we're paying for that we're increasing salaries for. And as far as the um, as far as the is the is the salaries increases, there are huge inconsistencies in the salaries. I had a, the auditor do a little report for me, showing me all the people who are getting these raises and all of those positions. Um, the disparity through gender bias in pay is blatantly obvious. In the positions that are getting paid $170,000, there's not one female person getting a, getting a raise to that level. There are people who have been with the city for over 20 years and people who have been with the city for six months that are getting paid more than the people who have been here for 20 years. There are people who are getting paid that have more people reporting to them than anybody else in the city and they're getting paid less than $120,000 a year. Not to mention that these salaries increases that you're saying will be done over two years you are giving us into, in this budget, there's, there's no rhyme or reason it's for me able to tell what next year's budget's gonna be. Is it gonna go up to 170 or is it gonna go higher? Because the Director of Natural Resources, which there was no comparison for, went up to 173. Will he be getting another raise next year? We don't know. So when you are doing these phased approaches, one would think that maybe you would be providing to us what next year's opportune increase will be for the next group of people. And um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's very unusual and I'll say this very clearly. We like to say we're the CEO, we're the CFO of the cities, like we're big conglomerates in the city of Quincy. We're a municipality. And when we want to compare ourselves to that, when, when private sector does do these types of operations, when they are actually doing salary incentives, they have their HR director as part of it because they absolutely have to make sure they're being fair and equitable across the board so these gender biases do not happen. So I do have a problem with the way this was done. How it was rolled out is embarrassing. You should all be embarrassed of yourself to have a meeting on April 24th, present it to us in a 20 minute meeting, and then not tell us, the chief financial officer of the city of Quincy, not tell us that he's working on the actual budget that we're going to have, the operating budget, within two weeks, that those salaries would be included in the budget. And if you wanna talk about justice and equity for one second, the people who work in the city, the city of Quincy, their morale must be really shot at this point because the salaries that you presented here shows, yes, very many people getting a giant raise. Two years, in, in fact, you'll be getting giant raises, going from $120,000 to $170,000. No increase in change of what you're doing, no reviews of what you're doing. You know, and you do work for an administration, and it is an election year. I'm just going to say all these things because it's really discouraging because the people at home, there's not one person I <laughs> ever have known to get a $40,000 raise over two years. So yeah, I think people are upset. They're not only just upset in the, in, the, in the community, they're upset in your city hall because they're not being treated fairly. It's disparaging and it's very, very unsettling to what's happening. There are people that don't feel comfortable telling you this. And then there are people who have come to you and told you, and I think there has been changes in some of their salaries. And I applaud those people for being brave enough to bring it up to you. But honestly, this is something I absolutely can't, cannot cannot support because of how you did it, how it was rolled out, and it just, it's just, and to use, this is the final, to use the tree warden as the example, the man was getting paid $93,000 and you gave him a 5,000, the, the salary, the job position, a $5,000 raise. Nobody's jumping over hoops to come here for $5,000 more. If you're going to use that as an example, use an example, but really that was just an excuse to be able to come back and actually give yourselves, including yourself, Mr. Walker, a giant raise, a giant raise. 
all of which, everybody who's getting it, some absolutely deserve a giant raise, but some do not, but not $170,000. Thank you. Council Yang. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I have some questions as far as process goes and how we got here. <coughs> so from my understanding, I think also want to thank Susan O'Connor because she put together a really thorough spreadsheet to be able to go through and figure out what we've had from fiscal year 20 through today. And I know that in fiscal year 21, we didn't have any raises for any positions across the board. And then from that to fiscal year 22, and then to fiscal year 23, we had the typical 3%. So I just want to thank you, Susan, because there was a lot of information that you put together for me that was really helpful to try to at least digest this to come um, to this meeting today. So the first thing I wanted to do when I was looking at this was look at the baseline of where folks are for fiscal year 23, and then take a look at what a 3% increase would have looked like if we just do the 3% increase, and then what the difference is between that and the percentage of the increase that's being asked of today. So I just want to know... I have that number in front of me, but how did we get to this place, right? Does that, does that make sense? So I have where we are with fiscal year 23, what's being requested for fiscal year 24, mm -hmm. and then the difference between what that number is versus if we just went from fiscal year 23 with a 3% increase to fiscal year 24. So some of the numbers don't add up. Like not, so, so for example, some of these positions don't have really even a 3% increase going into this next fiscal year. So I just want to understand how you got to the number that you're asking for for fiscal year 24. Through you, Madam, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're looking at, Council, so I don't have a frame of reference. Um, we weren't provided um, that piece of um, documentation from, from the auditor, so I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Mr. Mason can certainly speak to the specifics, but I, I don't believe that there are people that are not getting anything less than a 3%. Good evening, Council. Um, to speak on why some positions may not have a 3% is they may be empty positions. So this analysis was done on a position basis. Um, so basically comparing if there was an empty position in it, there was a recommended salary, but because that, there was nobody actually in the position, it may not have gone up 3%. Mm -hmm. There also could be situations where um, the market analysis pegged that salary as accurate, even when adjusted for inflation and adjusted for COLA or cost of living. Um, so yeah, it's a, I'm not familiar with that documentation either, but if it's from Madam Auditor, I'm sure it's accurate. We just need to better contextualize it if it's a question to the administration. No, sure, I didn't expect either of you to have it. It was a personal request that I had put out there. And yeah, it wasn't something that I had asked to you know have sent to you. I, it was an increase that I made personally to, to get the information. So essentially what I'm looking at is there's, just bear with me, there's nine positions um, of all of these positions that essentially are getting either roughly 3% between fiscal year 23 and 24 or under 3%, right? And so just, if you could just walk me through these nine, right? So the first one that I had found is a superintendent for cemetery under the cemetery department. And the request is a 0.21% increase. Okay. So you see what I'm saying? Like there's yeah, this, between that and then some of the other ones that are a lot more than 3%, I just want to understand how you got to the, where you are in this Memory request. Memory serves me correctly. That position got a, a, got a market adjustment last year. Um, so that would have carried through for this year. And so, when you do a market adjustment analysis, if it already occurred, then it, that, that would be my guess, but I'd have to see the list and dig deeper into it. But okay, and then this one, um, I thought would have been more, the fire chief is getting 2.42% so requested so as an the increase. The fire chief and police chief, um, they have roll-ins that go into their salary. They have what, I'm sorry? They have roll-ins. A what? Uh, it's called a roll-in. It's like hazard oh, pay. Oh, roll-in. Okay, sorry, I just pay. couldn't really hear you. That yeah, really... I'm getting a little reflection off this. That's kind of messing with me. Um, so yes, uh, so they're not included in there because roll-ins aren't something that's calculated in these payments. Um, so they would just get um, similar rates as that were negotiated with their individual unions. I believe that's how that works. Okay, and then the next one is the executive assistant for the Thomas Crane Public Library. She is just getting 3%. Um, and nothing over. But the increase that I have for these positions are the ones that, again, are either getting baseline 3%, roughly 3%, but nothing more than that, versus out of 103 positions that are on this sheet, right, everyone else is getting above and beyond 3%. Yeah, I can believe that, yes. Uh, it, and again, this is marketed data we're getting from Gallagher. So there's some, especially if there was frequent what we call job switching, as in somebody came into the position or a position was created recently, or you have somebody get promoted up through a position, 
that would have adjusted for the market. And if that was done in any of the last two fiscal years, it'd be unlikely they would get a percent increase above that or if it's a vacant position. Again, it's hard to, uh, I could talk kind of broad about the mm-hmm. data, but specific positions I'd have to dive deeper into. Okay, but let me shift it. So just, again, just to understand, you had the baseline salary for fiscal year 23, right? And then your baseline 3% increase to 24, that would have been what we were looking at, except we now have this study that came in that said, okay, these positions should really be making X amount of dollars based off of this research. So how did you get to though the numbers that are in front of us today? Because those don't necessarily, it's not like you just took the numbers that were recommended to us through that review and said, you know, let's drop them in there. And that's where we are, right? So how did you get from your fiscal year 23 baseline salary, taking a look at their review, and then factoring in those two things together, how did you get to the numbers that are in front of us for this proposal? Yeah, so um, to kind of harken back to the presentation by Gallagher. So we, we get the data, the data uh, comes in between October and, and February. The data is then aged through to be estimated for around June of 2023. Um, and that data age, aging is very important. Um, but that's what we did. We had, hey, these are the base salaries hey, that we have for FY23, 100%, right? And we said, okay, here's where we'd have to intersect the market in FY24 to be on pace with these recommendations. <coughs> Say that last bit, I'm sorry, is this coffee? This right? is, uh, then we get these recommendation of salaries for, for FY24 from Gallagher and we have that baseline FY23 and then we're trying to figure out how to intersect the market. So take those 23 salaries and have them grow to hit that FY24. Some of them are gonna be higher up and the intersection isn't that that aggressive. Some of them are gonna be lower and they're gonna result in a larger percentage increase. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you do a market adjustment, you don't, COLA is something that's, that's largely ignored during that process, except to age the data as if you're doing it over a couple of years. Okay, and then you said that some things like longevity, experience, et cetera, were included. Can you just, do you have exact information as far as what was considered when you, again, are looking at the numbers, right? But then you're thinking about, again, longevity, experience, et cetera. What were those things? So this was done, um, and I, I provided this documentation. Um, this was done on a position basis. So you look at individual positions, um, regardless of who's in them now, what any sort of what we call pools data demarc- demarcations. So pools data is something that's used, and my background is actually labor economics, so I like this stuff a lot. Uh, pools data is what we use, we want to compare things over time, but um, kind of uh, remove static from data analysis. Um, but they do that on a position basis. So they're actually looking at what individual roles make up the composition of, of, that, um, of that individual job posting, whatever it may be. They kind of roll that together, and then they compare it across similar jobs. Um, you're never gonna find the same job for community to community, they roll that data into a package that then, then does a geographic adjustment and a cost of labor adjustment. And that's how you end up with um, these recommendations. Okay, that's helpful to know that it's not based off the individual then. Um, so the other question I had, and I don't know if this is to you or back to Mr. Walker, is that um, Mr. Walker, you had said that anything over $10,000 is broken up to the, um, over the course of two years. And so the dollar increase that we're looking at for all these positions, this is what we're looking at for fiscal year 24. And then it'll be exactly the same increase request from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 25. Uh, sorry, can I interrupt, Chief? Um, For the ones over $10,000. So how it worked was, say you got a 20, uh, let's say you, uh, an individual got a $25,000 increase. All right, they would get 12500 this year, 12500 next year. Um, but if somebody was, say, to get an $11,000 increase, they'd get a $10,000 increase this year and then a $1,000 increase next year. And if somebody was to get, say, a $7,200 increase, they'd get all 7200 this year. And then what are they getting next year? They would get a three. They would get a three percent to maintain the. Well, I think that's we usually follow what the unions did. I wasn't privy to union contracts. I'm assuming three percent would be what they get next year. Okay, so if folks are getting under ten thousand dollars for fiscal year twenty four. They're going to get the three percent for the following fiscal year. Right? Yes, all all salary is going to essentially get the three percent um, as uh, that was referenced by Gallagher. If we were to implement this over two years. Um, you would still have to carry the cost of living adjustments. Otherwise, the data would age out of the market. So I guess that's my second question, right? Is that if it's, let's say you said, you know, $1,100, right? They'd get 10000 this fiscal year. And next fiscal year, they'll get 3% and the $1,000 or just the $1,000. No, 3% and the $1,000. I misunderstood your your, uh, your question, Counselor. But yes, you're correct. So everyone's going to get 3%. Going in from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 25. The only difference is that whatever is remaining from a $10,000 raise, right, is going to be added on top of that 3%. Correct, yes. Okay. All right. And then the other question I had too is for 
um, the positions Councilor Mahoney had mentioned that some of them are paid out of um, not just ARPA, but other funding sources like a grant. Uh, we have a bunch of state grants that um, positions are being paid out of. For the grants, um, I'm sorry, for the positions that are being paid out of ARPA, there's two of them that are listed as temporary employment. One is from Council on Aging, and then the other one is, um, is this is admin health. And so I assume because this is temporary, they're no longer with us, so their positions um, are no longer there, but. So they're, they're temporary positions. They're not, um, they're, it's almost like employment at will. A lot of them were brought on during ARPA, uh, if I remember correctly, was to fill gaps from some positions we had from people retired. I think one went and worked down at the, uh, the Kennedy Center to help out with kind of the reinflux. Yeah, one says council on aging. Oh, so okay. what, what position was that? It was just like a general helper. I, I actually don't know if the individual still is employed. They're not full-time positions. They don't get, I don't believe they get benefits or anything like that. Okay, and then the other one says admin health, but it doesn't say where that was, believe, what department that was in. Yes, I believe that was, um, I think the, I don't know what the, the nomenclature of floater. Um, so after the pandemic, when we kind of didn't have a good understanding of people coming back, uh, they provided admin help. They would sit at a desk, answer phones. Um, that was, that's what, yeah, there wasn't, there's not a full-time position or anything like that. Wait, so does admin health have anything to do with the health department or? Oh, you saying admin help? Health, health, like oh, health. health uh, H E A L T oh, health, sorry. yeah. Um, so the council on aging one you answered. The second one that's temporary is admin health. Okay, I'll, I'd have to look into that. I'm not super sure. I'll can discuss that with uh, with the HR department and figure out that position. Okay, then if I um, can you just go back to the other positions that aren't temporary though, that are still um, noted as being paid of, out of ARPA. So, do we know how? much longer we're going to be able to pay them out of ARPA? So ARPA expires December 31st, 2024. So all right. the fund has but to be according, after. again, just following up from Council Mahoney's question, right, and that was answered, I believe, by saying however long, uh, however much we're going to have for those funds is when we're going to be able to pay those positions, right? And so do we have the funding to pay them straight through the, that or? Yes, yeah, based on salary projections, we we have about, I think, six, seven hundred, uh, $800,000 remaining just in ARPA. Um, personnel services. We also have some re some remaining unassigned general uh, ARPA that can be moved towards it. But my most recent um, my most recent projections show that we should be able to fund them well through next year. So you can so we can pay them how they currently are being paid through the fiscal year for twenty four that we're currently looking at for the yes, salary. Yes, definitely through fiscal year twenty twenty four. And then fiscal year twenty five, those positions, those nine positions, will then go. Um, I believe they would, uh, I would defer to the administration. I okay. believe they, they may still be employed. They may still, um, they may get moved to the general fund. They may get moved to secondary grants. There's a lot of momentum to extend ARPA. Um, only, only about 60% of ARPA has been spent in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a big move to continue to extend that. For example, the county still has about 60% of their ARPA. The state of Massachusetts still has, I believe, a, fair, a considerable amount. It's very likely that legislation is going to extend, given the fact that ARPA wasn't clawed back during the debt ceiling discussions. It really does bode to that to that extension, but we're preparing for if that extension doesn't happen. And I uh, discuss we can discuss with the administration on what that move would be at the beginning of fiscal twenty five. Yeah, if either one of you can just let us know what to expect from that when fiscal year twenty four comes and goes, what we're going to plan to do with those positions. Um, did you have an answer now or? Thank you, Eric. Sure, through you, Mr. Chairman, Council, we, we would handle this the way we would handle any other position. Um, as Eric mentioned, this the secondary grant funding. Um, there are other sources of funding, and yes, in, in some cases, we may or may not incorporate those into the FY25 budget. And as Eric mentioned, there could be potential that these uh, positions get carried by ARPA for another year or so. Um, we would essentially handle it like we handle any other um, position, and, and all told, um, you know, it's not, I don't want to say de, de minimis, but it, we're not talking a substantial uh, increase in the budget, um, regardless of what path we take forward. But that's part of the discussion going on now, and we'll have a plan ready to go for fiscal 25 that uh, is conservative in nature, uh, taps all the resources that we can, and lays out uh, the right path forward. Okay. And then this, the last question I had on that then is, and I don't know if this is to you or back to you, Eric, but... The, the increases that we're looking for for those positions within ARPA, the increase is coming out of ARPA as well, not out of Correct. the general, right? Correct. Okay. Correct, Council. All right, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Council McCarthy. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of statements, and, and I think one of the, I know we got, all got the, uh, 
analysis book by uh, Gallagher that, that talked about the salaries and the increases. But I went through that, um, the compensation analysis uh, methodology that they, they used here. And, and it, it, you know, I, I put my private sector hat on at sometimes and, and look at this. And this is a, a standard job evaluation, establishing pay structures that lead all the way to the implementation and review. This is a standard way of doing things, of creating a, a new and improved, uh, we'll call it band levels, from minimum to midpoint to maximum. And I, and I think uh, folks, and, and I've talked to a few folks, they understand it. A lot of these folks, they, they, they were not at the level that they should have been at. And we haven't done this in, I don't know how long, um, in regards to straightening out, you know, DPW commissioners, natural resources commissioners, you know, balancing the, the playing field out there because a lot of these guys that are out there, um, and I'll pick on those two, for example, not only uh, do they oversee um, the DPW and natural resources, but multiple departments that are, 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 are within it. Dave Murphy, for example, really has recreation, cemetery, forestry, and then natural resources. I know what all umbrellas underneath, um, but um, you know we're getting a lot out of these gentlemen and ladies that uh, are running um, a lot of these departments. And um, I again, I think it's one of those deals where folks see the numbers, they are what they are. I mean, there's some folks that I agree with uh, my colleagues that you know probably are underneath the number uh, and should be higher, and maybe the the higher ones should be tweaked a little bit, but um, not much in regards to the higher ones being tweaked. Uh, there's a lot of coverage here in the city, um, and I and I again I I. It's been done a lot of times in the, in the company that I worked for where they have to throw the brakes on every number of years, do a study, make sure folks um, were adjusted uh, as uh, doing a market analysis, a job market analysis, and making sure that uh, they get up to the numbers that they can function with. Or well, folks get up and walk away. I, I made a point a meeting or two ago about Mr. Mason being a, Chief Financial Officer, and you know, um, he could get a lot more money if he left the city and went out and got a big payday and a bonus. Um, you know, I loves the job, loves the city. It's a secure job. It's a it's a it's a great job to have. But again, um, you know, they could go um, out there in, in the market, and um, you know, nowadays these numbers are not. Not that frightening out there when, when folks come in. Folks are, are actually sometimes upset if, you know, you know, the younger kids today, if they don't start at six figures. You know, and, uh, you know, so when you look at this uh, compensation analysis here, the, the steps that they went through, they go through the, the usual lineup of benefit consideration, and what folks do. I know they interviewed folks. They, they, they did a nice job. Um, I was one of them that just assumed up here on the council that it was going to roll into the budget and we were going to see this. Um, I know some other folks didn't think that, but uh, I, I just assumed once we saw this presentation that it was going to be part of this package because why wouldn't it be, why would they put it off another year? Why wouldn't they bring folks up uh, to where they should be? So um, I'm very... Um, positive about this whole approach. I know that there were um, um, some uh, difference, differences with the fire chief and the police chief, but Eric answered it with hazard pay and things that are rolled into the salaries. Those are some things I think the chief was making. Uh, the fire chief was up a little more than, uh, than, the, uh, than the police chief, but I know there's a, there's a balance in act. So I'm fine with this and I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Okay, motion has been made to approve um, on the motion. Councilor Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this isn't a question so much as it is a statement, if I could, a request to, um, to Eric Mason and to the administration. So I 
you know, I don't disagree with my counselor uh, across the wall here that I think at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about uh, paying folks, you know, adequately for the work that they're doing. And as we're continuing to grow as a city, you know, I'm always sort of conscious, especially coming into budget season about our resources, right? Which is why I always ask, you know, our fire chiefs, our, our fire chief, our police chief, even, you know, um, commissioners of, you know, Department of Public Works and public buildings, et cetera, right? If we have enough funded, right? And enough resources out there because we are growing um, exceptionally rapidly. So, you know, it, that isn't the question here for me tonight. The question coming into this and why I had requested the information I did and asked the questions I did is because it's about process, right? It's about setting the precedent moving forward. And Mr. Mason had mentioned that these increases aren't necessarily based on the person, but based on the position and the responsibilities within that position. And so I think, you know, if we're going to do this and, you know, Councillor McCarthy's right, we haven't done it in a long time, you know, we're setting the precedent for process moving forward. So what I would like to see happen is that if we could, either within the financial policies or separately from that as part of the budget review um, for salaries moving forward, is that if we can create and solidify and codify a process for how this is done moving forward, right? Because yes, this is going to be an increase that is significantly different as far as process goes from fiscal year 24 to 25. And I think based off of that, we do have a sense of what's gonna happen and what's coming in fiscal year 25. But I'm thinking fiscal year like 35 and 45, you know what I mean? Like folks that will be in these positions to have these conversations who will outlive us you know, we're setting again the standard and the process moving forward. And so, you know, I appreciate Eric answering those questions, but that should be a process that everyone should know coming into it, right? And so that whoever's coming into these positions within each of the department will also know, okay, this is how my salary is gonna be determined year over year. Counselors will know that and the administration will know that when they set the budget moving forward. Does that make sense? So I, I just wanna make sure that this process isn't, isn't like a one and done deal, right? Like if this is gonna be a process moving forward to evaluate salaries, let's not wait to Councilman McCarthy's point, for a very long time to pass for it to happen again. Let's make sure we're doing it year over year and being thoughtful about it because it's not just for us up here who are reviewing this information and the administration who's proposing the information, but for folks, I think, understandably, who are coming into positions and departments to understand how their raises will come in years to come, if that makes sense. So if I could put that in a formal request to get that done, get it established, again, whether it's um, incorporated into our financial policies or updated with how we can proceed with the budget, that would be helpful moving forward. Thank you. I'm gonna take a moment of privilege from the chair. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, so I'm gonna take, uh, now that all the other counselors who have at least spoke once. And Eric, I got a couple of questions for you. I think sometimes when we talk about methodology, we get lost on where all these numbers came from and stuff. Uh, if I remember the first night, you went around and polled all the cities and towns in the area. Oh, yeah. And a select group through that represent what Quincy, the size Quincy would be. Yes, Gallagher um, used 25 different communities in the state, as well as a large suite of communities in around New England, and then used survey data from around the country. So, and how did Quincy, how did Quincy rate? I remember in the original study you show, where were we compared to all these other towns? Generally speaking, Gallagher found us to be between the 37th and high 40s percentile. So we were in the lower part, obviously below. Yes. And yeah, we weren't in the middle. I, I think a lot of times we like to be in the middle, yeah. uh, but we weren't even in the middle. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I intend on voting for this because basically, I, I've also been over 20 years in the North Fork County uh, advisory board where we oversee a lot of budgets and mm -hmm. cities and towns around there. And I, I always was shocked at what some of the people in positions like in DPW and parks and different areas around the county were making. And some of them were not rich towns. And they were, they, the city was all, and as a former department head in the city, I also know that we were fairly low uh, along where everyone else was. So. I think we're in a we're in a period of time where if we want to keep good people and we want to keep them working, we have to pay them. And if you if you don't, you're not going to you're not going to retain good people. And um, a lot of people stay because they they, they live in the city and they, or they're connected with the city and they <coughs> love the city. But I think we also have to realize that we're getting over we, we're over 100,000 people. There's a lot we have to do every day, and we. As a ward counselor, I call department heads. I, I hound them, whether it's I see Al, who's always here. Uh, and we hound them and we go after them looking for things for our constituents and everything like that. And they've 
always returned the call, always done everything they could to pull those things through. And overall, the improvement I've seen, the professionalism and the group of people that we have. Um, so I intend on voting yes on this. And, um, and so thank you, Mr. Mr. Mason. Um, Council President DeBona has not spoken. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one quick, quick question on clarification, probably for the Chief of Staff, Mr. Walker. Um, just to clarify, is this 3% COLA, this cost of living built into these salary increases? That's correct. So it's all already, already in there. So there's no extra 3%. It's just built right into the number. Correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Devine and Council Mahoney. Council Devine hasn't spoken yet. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, and the last time we were talking about this, I was, I had done some of my own research, similar to how Gallagher would probably do it, but obviously not as thorough. But I continued to check multiple um, areas. West Newton, 88,000 people. Uh, they pay a lot of their positions more pe more than we do. Uh, they're smaller. Uh, Methuen, Malden. They have some of their jobs, they pay them more. Uh, I think a lot of the staff that we're talking about are, you know, uh, second generation, third generation people. They love Quincy and uh, they probably stayed working because they, they like their community and they're, like you were saying, that uh, we're on the lower part, you know, the 30 to 40 percent. And it may not have to these people, they're willing to take that pay cut because one, they, maybe they don't have to drive, but I believe that most of the people that I've been working with, they have this huge passion for their city, our city, Quincy. And um, if we're gonna be paying them at a 60% or 70%, we're still paying somewhere around the median. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much for this. Uh, I, I think that we have incredible people working here, and uh, they have the best interests in Quincy. That's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, Council Mahoney. Thank you. Could I just ask one question in regards to the, the union position that was being treated like it was gonna be taken out of the union, and um, it was stated that we were gonna take it out of the union, and I know um, that's not possible because that's why we have collective bargaining and that union had already closed and it's collective bargaining. So how are we handling that with particular job? Through you, Mr. Chairman, it, as you mentioned, Council, that is subject uh, to future negotiation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to necessarily be within the framework of a collective bargaining agreement. Um, it's a discussion between the administration Memorandum and, of understanding, and, and the union, mm -hmm. um, whatever shape that takes place. Um, as I mentioned, originally, the, the number is in there as a placeholder. Uh, we fully know that that position doesn't uh, pay that salary. And so we go through the full process mm -hmm. with the union and, and have that discussion. Um, it's a placeholder and, and nothing more at this point. We, we fully understand that. Yeah, so that's another thing. So th this is just, this is what I mean. So this salary was done and we were giving job raises and it was a union job and it was identified and we're still working that process through. It shouldn't be, it, it's just really, it's, it's not fair to the union heads. They're running those unions. It's collective bargaining. I don't think you're going through the right steps. The human resource person wasn't even aware of it. I, it's just, I have to say that you have to have your human resource person at the desk, at the table when you're having these negotiations. Otherwise, you make mistakes like this and it's not transparent. I'm gonna go back to the fact that it's about disparative pay to, and it's gender-based. It is gender-based. There is not one person, and, and I will remind everybody that when the, the Department of Natural Resources were created, we created a salary because we were gonna get this person from another town who was gonna get paid, he's getting paid a lot of money and we had to create the salary for him to come to the city of Quincy. And now we're making up, we're chasing that salary to make sure that everybody else at the top of the ladder, and magically it's $170,000. But then you say it's 13% or 10%, 37% percent or 40% is where we're coming in is what Mr. Mason just said, which means your salary raises should be coming, just generalizing, without doing anything else, just generalize, 13 to 13 or, 13% to 10% is what you should be bringing it up to. So maybe somebody who's making 125 might get at the top of that scale a $16,000 raise to bring them up to 50%. That's just generalizing. I'm, I know I'm simplifying here, but I'm just trying to, <laughs> so there's smoke and mirrors that are happening here in the city of Quincy. And the disparities, are, they're real, and they're frustrating to me because they're women who are not being paid their fair salaries. And I can look at this and very simply say this, and I can't help but pick on the human resource director because right in our own city, 
in the school department, the HR director in the school department gets paid more than our HR director does in the city of Quincy. And you just did a salary review. Did you even think to look at that? So I have to point these things out because you're not looking at it in a way that actually is fair and equitable to the people who work here in the city of Quincy. And then I also look at another one, and, and it happens to be another woman that happens to be here. And we have a Department of Natural Resources. I'm, I'm going to call this one out too, and I don't mean to, but I have to. I could call out a lot of them. And don't worry, I'm looking at some people in this room. I'm not going to call you all out, but you, but you should be very upset about your salaries. This other person who basically works seven days a week and 365 days a year because the programs go on all in all, when you looked at the other communities, and I did, I kind of dug into your stuff, you know, in the, into the information that you gave us. And you're looking at Brockton and you're looking at all the other places, but you didn't take into consideration that we have water and we have a pool and we have, you know, 25,000 different parks that you have. And, and this, is, this is the recreation person. The recreation person was making in the book 110, but in the salary, it looks like it came up to 116. Bravo. Bravo for her. But you know what? She probably manages more people than any of the department heads here in the city of Quincy does. And she has a program, and she loves her job. But she could probably, yeah, go to someplace else. But at the same time, you're not looking at apples to apples as to what she does. And then we talked about that we brought the natural resources person in. And when we did that, we were saying, so we didn't have to have department heads or the, 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 um, the head of the cemetery, which I think he might be retiring. I'm not sure. That's what I heard anyway. So I'm really very frustrated at the, at the fact that this is the way we're doing it and that we're not seeing this because we are really not being fair to the people who work here in the city of Quincy in the way we're doing these salary increases. There are people who have been here for less than a year that are gonna get a $30,000 raise and people who have been here who do equally amount that, that kind of work that will go, so somebody who's less than a year will go up to $150,000. Somebody who's been here for 20 years might go up to $130,000. And those jobs are real and their jobs are equal. They're equal. So I'm gonna speak for them because honestly, it's just across the board, and you can say that you go and you looked at all those other departments and all those other cities and towns and how they did it, but I'm looking specifically at the people who work here in the city of Quincy and how these things were done. And it wasn't done in a fair and equitable way. And I do have a problem with that. So I would say I'd want to make a motion to put this on the back burner to talk about it again, but I won't win that, so I'm not going to. So instead, I'm, and I will also say this, your general budget, the operating budget, even when you pay people out of other areas. You can bring them into the operating budget to be transparent to the taxpayers at home so that they know that the city of Quincy, that their tax dollars is going to pay for X number of people who work in the city of Quincy. Not extra people who, by the way, when we were talking about that position, that person resigned in um, March and he's moved over to the new um, Adams Library. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's fantastic how that happens. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's really unfortunate because I want people to have their fair and equitable raises here in the city of Quincy, but it's the top scale people who are getting the unbelievable raises and the people who are actually here and have been working here for decades and do their jobs day in and day out that are not being treated fairly. And that's the problem I'm having with this. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none. Uh, should we probably should call the roll. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. The motion before us is to pass the um, item 2023-46, the appropriation for the fiscal year 2024 general fund budget. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Count, um, Chairman Phelan. Yes. Eight to one it passes. The, the ayes have it. Uh, so we'll move on to the next item. The next item is for appropriation, which is the same as before for non-union salary increases. This is part of the sewer enterprise budget. So um, and do I have a motion? Motion was made, made to approve. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the clerk will read the roll. Council Andronico. Yes. Council Kane. Yes. Council Devine. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Wait, can I just ask a clarification? Is this part of the salary? This is, this is, um, 
when we do the budget, yeah. we do the general city budget, no. we do the sewer, yeah. and then we do the water. I have to say no, sorry, thank you. Okay. Council McCarthy? Yes. Chairman Phelan? Yes. Eight members. Okay, Six. next item. 20023-048. And this is for the, 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 the fiscal year 2024 water enterprise budget. We have a motion to approve. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the clerk will read the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Yang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Chairman Phelan. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. The, mo the motion carries. Um, we're going to go. We're going to take an item out of out of order, which is the uh, Frenchburg Golf Course Clubhouse and Forest Hill Park improvements. But before we do that, we're going to have to open the general council meeting. The president will come up, open the meeting at 7:30, and then we're going to go right into the um, right into um, right into the Furnacebrook Golf Course and the golf clubhouse. Okay, we got to start at 30, so I don't want to get started. We'll just be doing it. I'd like to call this meeting to order the Quincy City Council meeting Monday, June 12th, 2023. It is now 7.30 p.m. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Present. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Devine. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Phelan. Present. President DeBona. Present. Eight members, you have a quorum. Eight members, we have a quorum. Please stand if you can. I'd like to get a moment of silence, please use it as you wish. Please turn to the flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please call. Um, read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and not even acknowledged impermissible. Thank you. We're going to put um, Council McCarthy on record as well. So nine for a quorum. 
Um, we are going to go back and recess this city council meeting and go back into finance committee. Okay, um, I'm going to re-adjourn the, the Quincy City Council Finance meeting, and we're going to uptake uh, item number 2023-050, appropriation for $13,965,000 for the Furnace Brook Golf Course, Golf Club, and Forbes Hill Park improvements. So at first, uh, at, at this time, I'm going to have uh, the Commissioner of Natural Resources, Dave Murphy, make a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, members at home watching. I just want to uh, start by uh, thanking the folks uh, from Furnace Brook that have joined, joined us this evening, and thank you for the council for uh, taking us uh, out of our... I'd also like to... also like to introduce uh, members of my team that are here. We have our Recreation Director, Michelle Hanley, our Project Manager, Urban Forester, Mike Cassinelli, and our General Manager, Golf Pro, uh, Tom Ellis, is here with us as well. Tonight presenting with me uh, is Kevin Sullivan, Vice President of Fuss and O'Neill, and Tony Amenta, the Principal uh, of Amenta Emma Architects, who have been a great partner uh, in this design process. Um, I'm thrilled to finally be here. Uh, the commitment that we have made uh, to the community and to this council is to do this right instead of doing it quickly. Uh, there's been an extensive community process to get us to this point, and I'm very proud uh, to be here tonight presenting a project that I think is a uh, tribute uh, and will be a tremendous asset uh, to our great city. And I also want to thank uh, the folks uh, both in the community and at the golf course for their patience as we went through uh, this public process. Just by way of context, for those that don't know, the Furnacebrook Golf Course was once an 18-hole golf course. It's currently a nine-hole golf course. Uh, the other nine holes were across Furnacebrook Parkway, uh, Priscilla Lane, Puritan Drive, Joan Drive, that area were the other nine holes. It's been operating as a nine-hole golf course uh, for uh, quite some time. And in 1971, Furnacebrook Golf Club, Inc. signed a 50-year uh, agreement uh, with the city of Quincy that the city would uh, pay uh, the property taxes owed in return, at the uh, end of the 50-year lease, the city would take over um, ownership and control of the golf course. And that's what brings us here today. Uh, that lease expired uh, in late 2021. As of January 22, uh, the city of Quincy took over control and management of the Furnacebrook Golf Course. And I am proud to say that we have been operating it as a uh, true community golf course, uh, opening it up to the public while maintaining a membership model that I think makes the finances of the golf course work as well. Uh, we've been able to conduct beginner golf lessons through the help of uh, Mr. Ellis and his staff. I'm very proud that our combined uh, Quincy and North Quincy girls program uh, golf team uh, finally has a home. They were getting bounced around at uh, various courses in the city and they have a permanent home up at Furnace Brook. It serves as the home of our Quincy High boys golf team. We had our senior Olympics uh, golf uh, tournament up there this year. Our junior golf memberships are, are increasing every year with young Quincy residents uh, learning how to golf. Uh, we're starting a senior golf league uh, for Quincy seniors uh, this season as well. And our direct partnerships, uh, I mentioned Michelle um, and uh, working with Coach Salvucci and others in uh, opening up the game of golf for many young people in the city of Quincy. So very proud of uh, what we've been able to do uh, with ownership and control of a nine hole golf course. I'd like to talk a little bit um, about the community process that got us to this point. And I want to thank the councillors uh, that were part of that, uh, in particular Ward 3 Councillor uh, Kane, who was very patient as we had community meeting after community meeting after community meeting. And I want to thank um, his attendance and getting the word out uh, and helping uh, bring everybody to the table to make sure that many voices were heard uh, through this process. We go back to the beginning of 2021. The original design uh, had the uh, clubhouse proposed uh, adjacent to the existing building. Um, the parking would be located within the adjacent Forbes Hill Park. Uh, we attempted to solve what we perceived to be an issue of cars spilling into the neighborhood during large events, uh, Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day weekend, when they have the big tournaments up there. 
the feedback uh, we got on that was immediately negative. Uh, the, the surrounding community would uh, prefer to maintain the green space within the park than lose it to parking and, uh, and they can deal with the overflow parking on a couple of days of the year when they experienced it. So we went back to the drawing board in early 2022. We proposed a plan that had um, the parking to the edge of the perimeter of the park, which would have involved, uh, would have impacted the pine trees on the perimeter of the park. Uh, many folks in the neighborhood uh, did not appreciate uh, that as well. Uh, the clubhouse would again be situated in that same location. We could fit the parking uh, along the perimeter of the, of the park, but it would have resulted in the loss of some of the trees along the perimeter and the public did not um, want to do that either. So on June 28th of 2022, we had a community values workshop. We were working pretty closely with a, a group that formed the Friends of Forbes Hill Park. Um, we worked with them to put together what um, I believe is one of the better um, uh, community meetings that I've experienced in my time in government. Uh, we had an overflow crowd at the, at the clubhouse and everybody got together and we talked about what was important to us in this particular project. To the extent possible, we've incorporated um, as many of those perspectives as we possibly can, even knowing that some of those could have been in direct conflict. Um, November 9th, we followed up with a traffic and stormwater management meeting. We had traffic engineer Ali Rule, who's made some recommendations that I think will be before this council shortly about uh, some traffic improvements up on Forbes Hill. And we had our folks uh, from DPW Engineering working on some of the historic uh, stormwater issues uh, up on the project, uh, all of which we think will be improved uh, through the city's work um, on this uh, upcoming uh, park and clubhouse design project. Uh, I mentioned Mike Castanelli's name. At the end of April, we most recently hosted a walk in the park um, uh, workshop uh, before the skies opened up and we had uh, some rain. Um, but one of the uh, other uh, parts of this is giving the park some attention, redoing the courts that are there. We received a uh, $350,000 uh, award from CPC last year uh, to redo the basketball court, the tennis court, plant uh, a number of native trees in the park. Uh, from that community process, we learned that uh, people also want to see uh, additional uh, children's playground equipment and potentially a shade structure. So uh, there's uh, also some uh, requests for funding to uh, augment what our plans are uh, in Forbes Hill Park and also to address the historic uh, water tower, which is on uh, the park property. So here are some of the existing conditions. Um, photos that we have. I sent out a briefing about a month ago to the council showing some of the other pictures uh, to highlight the need uh, for uh, renovations and replacement of this facility. What we hope to do is to uh, replace the building, uh, which is really a house that has been um, kind of cut up and morphed into a golf clubhouse. Um, the, the, the infrastructure within the building um, is in desperate need of repair. Uh, but as importantly, the lack of accessibility. Um, the men's locker room and restrooms are in the basement floor. The women's locker rooms and uh, restrooms are in the uh, upper floor. Uh, it really doesn't meet uh, a lot of the modern codes and uh, needs to be replaced. Our maintenance building is in worse shape. Um, it, it really, uh, the roof is compromised, it's falling down. We have lean-tos and Connex boxes protecting the equipment uh, and is not appropriate working conditions for any employee. I mentioned we're going to make repairs to historic Forbes Hill Tower. The tower is about 120 years old. It really sets the character uh, of the park and of Forbes Hill, so much so that the golf course has adopted it uh, as its new logo. Uh, and I mentioned the planned park improvements, uh, which is based on our community feedback for the new shade structure, the new courts, uh, tree plantings, children's playground, uh, and much more. So the request before you this evening is for 13965000 this is a uh, breakdown of those anticipated costs. Um, we're looking for a little over $9 million for the clubhouse building, uh, about $2 million in site work to include water and sewer infrastructure, uh, the parking lot, paving, et cetera. Uh, a, um, a prefab building for the maintenance facility in the exact same location, uh, a little over 600,000. We have uh, furniture and fixture and equipment in there for 111,000. Uh, you'll see a request for $195,000 for golf simulators. One of the uh, key elements of this new building that doesn't exist in the existing building is a simulator lounge in the lower level. Uh, and why that's important, why I'm calling that particular line out is um, we have talked to a number of other courses to include municipal courses 
who have simulators and they generate significant revenue, primarily in the off season. Um, uh, Braintree, South Shore, and Hingham. Uh, I think Grand Lynx just added a simulator. So our goal is to uh, make this a 12 month um, revenue cycle by adding the simulators uh, in the lower level. They're not gonna attract the same amount of golfers, obviously, that the entire course would, um, but at the same time, we think it's a, uh, a great amenity and also uh, the ROI on those simulators is about a year and a half. We have uh, IT needs built in there, security needs, AV needs, uh, working with National Grid to get the power needs that we need for the building, uh, commissioning of the building, uh, temporary facilities. Uh, one of the major changes that we've made is part of our community process. Um, you know, our goal was to operate in the existing building until such time as the new building was built by building it directly next to it. By moving the building uh, to where we're uh, proposing it, we're moving it uh, away from the houses on Reservoir Road, which was very well received by Mr. Potter and others. Um, but at the same time, it's gonna require us to demo the building and operate out of temporary facilities uh, for the better half of 12 months. Uh, I have in here the Forbes Hill Tower report here as we had a uh, structural report done by Fuss and O'Neill. Uh, we're going to have to repair the roof and repoint uh, much of the granite on the tower. We have the additional funds for the park improvements uh, we have the uh, construction administration fee, uh, and we also have the, uh, the owner contingency in there. There's also a construction con contingency built into the 11.6 million. This is a, it says construction contingency, it's just an owner contingency of 582,000 to bring us to that number. So that is my background. What I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to members of the project team, and I'd like to start with uh, Kevin Sullivan from Fuss O'Neill. Good evening, uh, my name is Kevin Sullivan, Fuston O'Neill. As Commissioner Murphy mentioned, I've been involved with this project for several years now. Um, throughout all the community involvement, I was at a lot of the meetings. And what we, one of the things that came out of the, um, the public meeting with the community was the actual location of the clubhouse. And we had tried a couple different locations and it moved it sort of more towards the neighbors at that meeting, it came out that everyone would prefer it right where it was. So we were able to put the building back essentially where it was. Um, so taking the existing clubhouse and then the cot storage building there. Um, additionally, there was a lot of discussion over the parking and location of the parking. The existing parking lot has about 56 spots. We were able to reconfigure the parking so we can add an additional 20. We're at 76 spots right now. Um, <clears throat> mostly by adding 16 spots along the road going out to Summit Ave. That's about it for the site. I'll turn it over to <coughs> Tony for the uh, building itself. Evening, Commissioners. My name is Tony Amenta. I'm Amenta Emma Architects. Um, I think we're just going to use this. So what you're seeing in front of you is just a rendering. Yes, I know. What's that? Good. Uh, on the screen is a rendering of the new facade or north face of the clubhouse. I'm going to go into the floor plans. I'm going to talk a little about the materials that are going to be used in the construction. But as you look at this rendering, you can see um, the front entrance is off to the right. You're seeing a a, a, a person walking up to the front door. Uh, off to the left side, you're seeing a, a covered deck, which we'll see a little bit more in the plans. That covered deck faces due east, so it has both a water view and a view over the first hole, as opposed to the existing deck, which is located more towards the neighbors. This is an intentional move to keep the noise down that could be generated off that uh, deck uh, after hours or even during, uh, during the day. Um, I think we can advance the slide. Yeah. Uh, this is a shot, uh, more or less, less, less of a rendering, but more or less the uh, other side of the clubhouse. You're looking back now towards the deck. What we did with the plan is took advantage of the sloping site, and we have a full level that is uh, basically um, fully exposed to the landscape on the putting green side or the south side of the building. But from the north side, as you saw the rendering previously, it looks like a one-story building. So um, you're looking now up at the deck. 
there is an external staircase that allows the uh, golfers, members, and others to come right from the course up and into the deck and then into the clubhouse. There's also a door there you can see that leads to that lower level for uh, access to the toilet rooms and uh, locker facilities. Um, next slide, please. So looking at the uh, floor plan, we're first looking at the main level or entry level. The entrance is at the top of the sheet. You can see the double doors there. Coming into the reception space, off to the right side on the plan is the pro shop, which uh, consists of a small uh, merchandising area, a bag room in the corner, and an office for the golf pro, small office for the golf pro. On the other side of the entrance is the club uh, manager's office, and then there are the uh, toilet facilities there. Directly across from that is the elevator that brings you down to the lower level, and uh, an open staircase that also brings you down to that level on the right side. Entering those two large spaces, uh, they're, they're almost equally sized. You have a uh, dining area or um, um, and then off to the right there is a covered porch you saw in the rendering. And on the left side is the kitchen, which serves that dining area. Those are all the spaces on the main level. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can look at the lower level. What we did here is we, on the left side, you can see those uh, rectangles that are, that are kind of a gray color. Those are all the uh, golf cart um, charging areas. So we brought the Instead of having the two buildings like you have today, both functions are combined into the one clubhouse. So on the lower level, we have the cart storage area. Carts will be washed directly outside and an overhead door will be driven inside this lower level area for their charging and overnight storage. That's one of the larger spaces on the lower level. Directly to the right of that are the uh, golf simulators that Dave mentioned earlier. There are four simulator stations that are identical uh, those can be accessed either through the elevator coming down to that level or through the staircase that you see directly opposite the golf simulators. Behind those functions are the men's and ladies' locker rooms. They're uh, equivalent sized and equivalently equipped. Two showers in each, uh, changing facilities and toilet and sink area there between, between that um, <clears throat> entrance area and the lockers themselves. The remainder of that lower level houses the mechanical, electrical, and uh, it, uh, rooms for the uh, equipment that maintains the clubhouse. Next slide, please. Oops, maybe that's it. Uh, so I, we're going to just then turn to the boards that I have in front of me that, that you see. Those uh, describe the finishes that uh, will be utilized, both the exterior and interior. The board on the left has the exterior finishes. Uh, predominantly, we are using a fiber cement product that simulates uh, shingles, wood shingles, has a more uh, has a greater durability, and uh, and requires less maintenance over the years. That is the main um, material used in the exterior. There's also uh, some uh, siding on the rear side. I think that you saw in the rendering. That siding is also a fiber cement material with the same characteristics, with just a slightly different look. All the windows are thermal pane, and uh, there is a skirt material of the uh, stone. It's natural stone that's applied. It's a thin veneer that's applied for a better durability. Um, those are most of the materials on the exterior. Just want to stop and talk about sustainable features of the project a little bit. Um, we uh, have um, engineered this building to be solar ready, uh, so it will uh, take the... Um, south facing side and be able to add solar panels to that uh, very steep roof so i think it'll be a, a very good use in the future should you decide to go that way we also uh used a complete wood structure um probably 90 to 95 percent of the structure of the building is wood so it's a very sustainable material it's an embodied uh, carbon uh use and therefore uh more sustainable than a steel and concrete st concrete structure so we, we um, were able to utilize that. Also, I think we do have the use of electricity for um, our heating and cooling. So we will do not have any natural gas in this building with the exception of the kitchen equipment. 
which still tends to uh, be the favored um, usage for things like ovens and and um, grills and such. So we do have gas just for that cooking equipment. The rest of the building is electric. We have some car charging stations that are located out in the parking for electric vehicles and uh, the capacity to add more when uh, those become more popular. Um, the, I believe, you know, we, we looked at other aspects of sustainability such as passive house or net zero, but uh, the, the cost to add these features and some of the um, some of the practicality of doing a passive house structure, mitigated by uh, things like the large number of windows that are generally associated with an area overlooking a golf course, making it impractical to uh, to make this a, into a, a totally neutral electrical building or a passive house, if you're familiar with that terminology, which is a, usually requires a super insulated um, uh, exterior and a limited number of window openings. In the interior, we are again using uh, very much recycled materials or sustainable wood. There'll be sustainable wood f engineered flooring for the major dining area. Um, otherwise, we are using recycled materials in, in the deck and in the carpets and other areas uh, of the clubhouse where we possibly could. Um, so the kitchen areas will have the what you would suspect uh, would be the materials used in a commercial kitchen, quarry tile floors, and sustainable wall materials. Everything is designed to the newest, uh, in, designed over code, I should say, in terms of requirements for both uh, uh, energy usage Primarily, this will be a fully accessible um, clubhouse on both levels, not only with the elevator, but access uh, from the outside to the front door and other uh, entrances as well, side doors and that rear door I mentioned from the putting green area. I believe that describes the building. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the uh, crux of our pre presentation, if there are questions. Okay. Sure. All right. Uh, Councilor Kane. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, first I want to thank you uh, for your patience and hard work in making this a truly collaborative effort to make this project the best that it could possibly be for not only the area residents of the Furnacebrook Golf Course and the Forbes Hill Park, but for the citizens of Quincy. Um, you know, it, it, you've done everything you can to uh, make this open and uh, collaborative. And um, I've been happy with the process since the very beginning, so um, I'm not gonna say much more and, and I'm just gonna make a motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve on the motion. Council Ryan. I was gonna say something else. Oh, okay. Uh, Council Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Commissioner. Um, so I have a few questions. I'm going to start with the revenue side of things and then go to the build out of the clubhouse if I could. So on the revenue, um, you, you had provided uh, projected revenues up until this point and then actuals as well. Um, and based off of that, for the projected annual revenue, um, we were at projecting about 948 and we came in about 848. And so with about a 10% difference of uh, being under what we were projected, are you using that to then also you know, inform what we're projecting for revenue moving forward, or I mean, the clubhouse isn't built yet, right? So the revenues are based off of the clubhouse as it currently is, um, and I know it's difficult to project based off of something that's not quite there yet. But are you? What's your process right now for projecting revenue moving forward? So I, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect on the revenue versus actual to date, and then through the year end. Uh, you know, June is a very strong month for us as well, too. Um, so. You know, our projections, I, I think, are a little bit stronger than that 848 and closer to the 940 uh, uh, number. So our projections that we provided to the council uh, based on the council's request were a uh, year-to-date uh, operational uh, revenue. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that as we take a look at what a new clubhouse would draw 
couple different areas in particular. I mentioned the simulators, I think, are a significant revenue enhancement. Um, you know, we're projecting uh, probably two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue from uh, those uh, uh, simulators. If you take a look at the folks we've talked to in Braintree and Hingham, they don't have an available hour all year, um, and they put up temporary simulators that aren't going to be nearly as nice as the ones that we're planning. Uh, for this particular facility. So we think that's going to be a significant enhancement uh, in our revenue. We also think it's going to increase interest in the course itself, whether that's walk-up members, uh, walk-up players, or additional membership. Um, you know, we've artificially um, suppressed the membership rate uh, during construction, knowing that there's going to be some significant inconveniences. Uh, we also think that if we return to some of those historic uh, membership levels for when it was a private course, um, we're not necessarily increasing the membership cost, we're just going back to the historic numbers. That also will increase uh, our revenue pictures as well, too. So, you know, I, I, the other piece of it is the food and beverage. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's an opportunity there. We have an existing um, uh, contract uh, that we signed um, that expires in 25 that we'll probably have to renew once that expires, too. So uh, the facility that's there now, uh, if you're familiar with it, is um, not great. Um, and I do think that the um, a building a, a normal kitchen, if you will, I think um, will allow folks to have regular food service up there uh, compared mm -hmm. to uh, what we can provide now with the facilities we have. Okay, so, so you're I, I, I do think each one of those pieces is going to enhance the revenue. Mm -hmm. I do want to uh, make clear that, um, you know, I know that the uh, bonding uh, obviously, we're looking for um, a significant amount of money. I think when uh, Mr. Mason's schedule has it over 19 million, when you add in all the interest, you know, I do think the uh, life of the asset versus the life of the bonding, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a formula there uh, to see what the ROI in this project is. Um, but we can discuss that. Yeah, that was actually my second question. Was uh, um, so sorry, just to summarize the first one. So. We're anticipating that the, the revenue coming in for the dues, and you're right, because this actual only goes to the beginning of June, so it doesn't include the rest of this month, um, which you said is usually the busiest season around there, right? So, but um, it, outside of that, you're anticipating that the dues revenue, and then is it the, would it be the greens fee income would go up as well with the new clubhouse? Uh, potentially, yes. Yeah, okay. you, you would see an increase in virtually every single one of those mm -hmm. lines. Um, again, I, we're not projecting that. I'm not saying new clubhouse equals X in golf revenue. Um, what we are saying is we know that the uh, simulators will generate significant money. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there are some other enhancements that we can predict uh, based on uh, what we will we'll see in a new um, a new golf course clubhouse. Okay. No, I mean, I prefer you to be conservative, so that's, that's right. fine. It's just, I was pointing out those two um, specifically because those seem like the two largest revenue generators, and so that's why I was asking about those. Um, and then to the second point, which you touched on, so the revenues that we're anticipating, from, or that we get from this, right, so based off of this um, this profit and loss budget performance, the revenues that we're anticipating at 948, moving forward, would that be used to then pay down every year's payment for this bond? I would think so, Councillor. Again, that's a decision that's made by um, um, Unify and the Mayor's office, but you know, certainly, um, I don't want to call it profit, but as you look at the net operating revenue, uh, it presents some opportunities to pay down some of the debt. Um, you know, I, I think Mr. Mason has presented a 20-year um, bond, and I think, as I mentioned, you know, we're looking at a 75 to 100-year building. So, when you look at the revenue picture for that period of time versus the net cost, the 19 and change uh, on the bond itself, there's a, an equation there that you know. I'll leave to Muni Five, but uh, I think shows a, an ROI of 35 or so, 40 mm -hmm. years. Yeah, if somebody can answer that, I mean, I think, you know, I asked because to me that would make sense, right? If we're putting money into improving this um, this location and it generates revenue, and then obviously minus the expenses, if there's any profit left over that profit, I and to me, should go back to paying the loan off. And so is that going to be the case? Can somebody confirm? Through, <coughs> through you, Mr. Chairman. In a de facto sense, Yes, Councillor. Um, revenue comes in. It's a general fund. We didn't segregate this. It's not an enterprise fund at the time being, so it's not entirely segregated like the water or sewer. Um, but new revenue that we wouldn't have otherwise have beyond a rebuilt clubhouse, if we did not have a rebuilt clubhouse with the new revenue that that clubhouse was generating, yes, that goes back in and that ultimately, at the end of the day, the bottom line, yes, that helps pay back that debt. 
it's not going to be a one for one, at least for the first few years or the first uh, several years. But, um, you know, absolutely, we're getting more revenue based upon the borrowing we're doing. And that revenue does offset uh, to some degree Mm -hmm. the cost. Yeah, I mean, I don't I I feel as though it's going to be like a little bit of Robin Peter to pay Paul. But would it be possible to set it up as an enterprise account so we know how much of the revenue is going back into paying down the bond and then how much uh, additional would have to be paid out of the general fund? Sure. Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's a discussion I think we could have fiscal uh, 25 time, Councillor. Okay. Um, The budget uh, has been set. Um, Everything that we've done programmatically and planning uh, has been based off of uh, not going down the enterprise route. Um, And I I believe, my memory serves me correctly, Councillor, that was a discussion uh, with the body. back when the city did take over the course. Um, and I think there was a, a general level of consensus that no, let's keep it <coughs> as is as a general department of the city where, you know, knowing from a bookkeeping standpoint, yes, that revenue does in fact offset, mm-hmm. but it's not segregated. It's not line by line where you see that the revenue offsets that particular cost like you would in the water enterprise budget, like you would in the sewer mm-hmm. enterprise budget. But, um, you know, I know from the mayor's perspective, he's been, uh, certainly open to that, and if, if that's a discussion that the council would like to have um, next fiscal year, I, yeah, I'm sure he'd be happy to ha- have it. Yeah, because the first payment isn't coming up until the next fiscal year anyways, correct? Yep. Okay. Um, and then is it the is it 3.5% rate? Is that a fixed rate that we're going into it with? Uh, that's a question for Mr. Mason. I believe it is. Yeah, that, that's a fixed rate. Everything that we do would be a fixed rate. I'm sorry, council. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then so... The other question I have about revenue is what we're anticipating coming from the tenant. And so, uh, Mr. Commissioner, you had mentioned building out a kitchen. I mean, this is, I love this stuff when we're talking about building out a space for kitchens and whatnot. Um, So I'm going to dive in a little bit there if I could. So, uh, again, just looking at the room rental fees from this past annual year, I mean, it's it's insignificant, right? The room rental fees, I, I believe, are like a half a percent of the entire revenue and and that's still money that's going to be contributed towards the full uh, amount of revenue that we're getting in. And I imagine that when we then build out this kitchen and this new clubhouse, there's going to be hopefully more folks that will be coming in um, and using it as a draw, right? So like literally it will make an impact to the revenue because we're hoping that more folks will come in, <clears throat> excuse me, and actually dine in this space. But, you know, figuratively, I imagine that it will also be a draw for folks, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, to then rent the room as well. So. For me, looking at this and then looking at the footprint of the actual um, kitchen and dining space too, it's quite large uh, for the 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 overall footprint of the clubhouse. I don't have a number of which slide it is, but one of the slides you had shown the kitchen and the dining room, the covered porch, and then the office, et cetera. Yep, right there, right? So the kitchen is a big portion of the footprint. Um, do we know yet who the tenant is going to be? Do we have a lease agreement, did they inform the design, et cetera? I mean, I don't have numbers of square footage here, but I'd be curious to see who helped to inform that process, right? And again, just so you understand my process and my thinking here is that, you know, going into a space, uh, we are essentially the landlord, right? So the tenant's gonna come in and tell the landlord what they need to outfit the space as best possible for them to make to make money, right? And so you're looking at it and saying, okay, between the kitchen and the dining room, you know, <coughs> this is gonna be the size of my kitchen to put out X amount of food per day and this is the amount of you know, seating I have in the dining room to churn tickets over to make that revenue, right? So I, I would hope that the tenant helps to inform us when we put this footprint together. So do we have that tenant in place yet? Do, do we know who we're talking to? Do we have a lease agreement? Do, you know, Walk me through that if you could. I'd be happy to. So we have an existing tenant uh, with the Fours Group, and they were very helpful in forming the process. Now, we have a three-year uh, agreement with the Fours Group, and uh, my guess is in late 24, uh, we're probably going to issue another RFQ. Now, the relationship has been, I, I think, very uh, strong. Uh, the Fours Group also uh, operates Pine Hills Golf Club. They've got experience in running golf tournaments, which is critical. So uh, just to be clear what we're hoping to do here, we're not looking to run a restaurant. Uh, I think it's very important. So we have a golf course. We want a complimentary facility. So if we're running a golf tournament, instead of going to another location, you can now have your after tournament um, event at that golf course. If you're a local resident that uh, wants to go up on a Friday night and grab a meal and a drink and watch the sun go down from the deck, it's a great place for it. Um, I I don't see us being um, in the function business. I mean, this, this isn't trying to be a mini Granite Lynx. This is trying to be the best Furnace Brook it can be. 
Um, so I, I think there is a, an important distinction to be made based on its location within the neighborhood um, that we need to be pretty selective on what types of events that we allow here. Um, I think historically we've seen uh, neighbors that have birthday parties or baby showers or things of that nature. Um, and I, I think that would be what our target audience would be. I don't um, envision us getting into the uh, function business. I don't think that's what this is supposed to be. Okay, so their lease is um, scheduled to be up at the end of this calendar year. Um, do we have a sense then of what we are putting in that RFQ for uh, as far as lease terms go? So their contract, um, the lease we have with them expires in early 25. We would issue it in late 24, so we were ready in case there was, were a transition. Uh, I'm hoping that they're interested, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that a the terms of an agreement uh, for this facility are different <laughs> than the terms of the agreement that, of mm -hmm. the facility that's there. It's quite a cro uh, contrast. Um, I know that um, you had raised an important issue at, a, uh, at our first budget hearing. Uh, about uh, responsibilities and depreciation and repairs and equipment and things like that. So um, I do think we're going to spend some time reviewing um, uh, new uh, language in the lease agreement going into the new facility versus our existing um, place. If you've seen the kitchen, you'll understand the contrast I'm trying to make. Yeah, but we don't have a sense right now about what those terms look like as far as um, duration of the, the lease, if it's going to be, you know, any funds as far as uh, what like the cost would be, you know, for them to be able to enter into the lease and are they going to pay for any amount of the improvements or are we going to deduct any part of the lease because we are doing the improvements out of our pockets? You know what I mean? Like it, these are all the kinds of things that I, A, am super interested in, but B, also just want, I, I think it's important, right? Because I, I you know, I don't golf, and so I can't, uh, you know, say to you that I would go up there for golfing or for entertainment, whichever it is. I, I just don't, I don't golf at all, right? So I, I can't speak to that. But I, I can speak to, you know, if this is a space that folks will be wanting to come to to dine and or, um, you know, as far as the tenant goes coming into the space, I imagine they do want to make some profit as well as the tenant. Understand, and, and they should 100%, right? So to some extent, we need to make sure that it's going to be beneficial for both us and the tenant. And I just want to know what that lease is going to look like to make sure that both sides are going to see this as a benefit, right? Again, it's just, even if folks aren't coming up here for um, using it as a function, and it's still, it's still a pretty large square footage of the, the clubhouse overall. So again, do we have a sense of any of that information? Yes. So what I can say, Councillor, is the original agreement that we have is a three-year agreement in anticipation of providing and building a new facility. My, my recommendation, although this hasn't been determined, is that uh, when we decide um, on the next RFQ that we do a longer term lease and that would have to come before this body. So, um, you know, I would suggest that through the course of uh, the end of 24 and early 25 as we get into that process, uh, my recommendation uh, to create much more consistency up there is that we look beyond the three year agreement and the next um, food and beverage partner that we have. Okay. Um, I'm really struggling with this only because I, you know, I agree with my colleague, uh, Councillor Kane, and that I know, and I, I just know from even communicating with you how much work um, and time you've put into this, and my colleague has as well over the last year and a half. Um, it, but just like knowing, again, the amount of money that goes into building out a space and, you know, the equipment and the depreciation of that. And, you know, again, for the tenant to make sure that it's beneficial and having the right tenant in there. And I hope that the forest does come in, right? They're, they do a phenomenal job and, and I'm a big fan of their food, right? But um, it's, it's a big impact. And the, the majority of the cost here that we're looking at, too, is, you know, the renovation of the clubhouse, right, at $9 million. And, and I think that both of those things have to be aligned in order for us to make sure that we are building out a space that is going to be amenable to whatever tenant we're bringing in. And you had mentioned as well that we've already been talking to the fours about um, essentially having them help us, right? And say like, this is what you're looking for and this is what works for this space. And so I think that's great. I, I just, I struggle with not anything else except for the clubhouse piece because I think it's really important again that we are producing something that's going to be a space that's amenable to the tenant and for us to, to have the most benefit, right? And the most bang for our buck and the most revenue that's gonna be generated from that because going in and redesigning a kitchen is awful and brutal and it just, it's so costly, right? And so, I mean, if, if it's possible, would it, you said that, so we're gonna be revisiting a lease, um, potentially what a new lease would look like in the fall, correct? 
Of 24. Of this year, in the fall of this year. And so... Of 24. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. That's where my head is. Um, but we'd be working on it. Could we... I mean, we could start working on it before that, before next year. Because that's when we're also anticipating that this would be open and done, right? According to the timeline. Yes. So to me, it would make sense that we would have the lease in place. We know what tenant is coming in here. They are informing on what's going to be expected for the build out. And then they would be ready to go as well for when it opens again in 24 versus then if we were to open the space and then look for a tenant, right? So I, I don't know if this is possible, but until we see the lease, is it possible to approve the funding request except for the clubhouse just so that we know what the impact is going to be um, depending on the tenant that we're bringing in. I think that will help us to better understand the cost of actually building out the kitchen and the dining space. Well, we have an existing lease council now that we have a three-year agreement through the beginning of 25. The new agreement would be for a period of time beyond the existing uh, lease, which would take us beyond that spring of 25 piece. That process would take place in late 24 to make sure that we were ready for whatever comes our way in early 25, whether it's a renewal with the same partner, whether it's a new partner to come in. So we still have a ways to go before we get to a, uh, a new RFQ process and a new uh, lease document with any food and beverage partner. That's still a little ways off. Yeah, and I don't imagine that that work isn't gonna be done and done, um, you know, you've always been again very thoughtful about, you know, seeing all angles to things. It's just like, I, I again, just from my personal experience, I would just, I would feel more comfortable seeing a lease um, and the terms of that lease prior to outfitting a space for a tenant that we're not aware of yet. Council, just one thing, point of information. If the Please, no, yeah, of course, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, having been a former department head, Dave had to go out and get a bid and get all that stuff. It's it's actually under Chapter 30B, if I'm not mistaken. A lease, anytime we do a lease, we have to go out. It goes through the purchasing. It's, it's run under state law. And when you have an agreement for three years, you have to have a pretty good reason for get, knocking the person out. You They have to have violated something in the contract for you to knock them out. You're pretty tied into it for the three years. No, no, I'm not looking to knock them out. I, I'm just looking to see what we are looking to propose for a future lease. Even if they're the ones that we end up entering into a new lease with, that's fine. I, I have no issue with that. I'm just more again talking about the logistics, like the process of it, right? Is that, you know, regardless of the tenant, regardless of, you know, if they're going to enter into it again, fine, that's great. But for me, it's, it's I'm looking at a space. We're going to renovate that space. And a good chunk of that space is going to be renovated specifically for a tenant that I, I don't know who, I mean, they could decide that they don't want to be in there anymore. Who knows, right? But I, I just would like to see the terms of that lease from our end, at least, so that I know what we're going to be entering into and what we're asking for from any tenant and how that's going to impact the cost of the build out. Does that make sense? So I'm not concerned about the tenant leaving. I'm, I'm just concerned about the terms that we want to enter into for a new lease under, like in the new clubhouse. Through you, Mr. Chairman, and the other piece of this council I think is important is that when we enter into a lease of public property, we would be working with the purchasing department to make sure that whatever RFQ we issue lists an appropriate fair market value for any rent that we would be charging for that particular space. So, you know, I, I think there is a, a, a rather substantial process that's going to go into the new building compared to the facility we have up there now that I hope brings confidence to this body uh, especially if we're going to go beyond the three years and actually have to present that document to this body that you would have a seat at that table as it relates to the language, the terms, et cetera. But the clubhouse will already be in the process of getting built out before the lease is shown to us. I, I See, I'm, I'm hoping we could do it the other way around. Like, I want to see what the lease terms are going to be before we say, okay, this is what we're going to move forward with with building out the clubhouse. Do you, you know what I mean? Because we want, we're, we're, there's going to be things that we're asking for from the tenant to fulfill. And I think that informs how this, is, this space is going to be built out. I, I do understand your perspective, Council. I, I, I don't know how difficult it would be to get uh, uh, bidders on a um, clubhouse or facility that is, still hasn't been built and isn't coming, um, and the existing agreement doesn't expire for another two years. So, I, you know, I, I think I understand where you're coming from, what you're saying. I just think if we did that now, I think we'd be getting ahead of ourselves when we have an agreement with another provider 
that still has uh, almost two years on it uh, in a facility that's not built yet. That's the only piece that I think from a timing perspective, I, I don't know that we get as much interest in that. Yeah, I just I would feel more comfortable having again that lease in place and, and under or at least you know understanding what that lease looks like because again it when you're talking about the clubhouse you're talking about everything like you're talking about the equipment you're talking about supplies right like everything down to like how many forks and napkins and etc all those things that you need how many tables you need in that place too and so I'm not saying you're wrong I'm just trying to clarify my my perspective on that and where my discomfort comes from and so I I would feel comfortable moving forward with this if we could just hold on the clubhouse piece until we see even just a, a draft of a lease of things that you're looking for, thinking of in a tenant, um, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable with moving forward with this. But I, overall as a plan and overall as what this project is, again, like that's, this, there's nothing negative here. It's just for me, the pro, I can't shake how I would be comfortable with that process moving forward. So if it's possible, could we, Mr. Chairman, is that something that we could do is move forward with this but without the clubhouse piece until we see a lease in place or a draft of a lease? On the motion. Oh, I didn't mind. Okay, Council Council Kane. Um, I'd suggest that we take a vote on this. If you want to cut out a piece of the funding, and we just move forward that way instead of putting anything on hold. Okay. So there is a motion on the floor to cut out a piece of the funding. Is there a certain amount you'd like to cut out? It's the clubhouse piece. So it's nine thousand. Sorry, nine million twenty-one thousand ninety-eight dollars. Okay. Uh, so there's a motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, the chair will take a moment of privilege. Um, sit on the North Fork County Advisory Board. We have a golf course, President's Golf Course, here in Quincy. And we've bid it out. It's bid out every three years. It has to by law, by state law. And when we bid it out, they know what the conditions are. And the kitchen is set up the way it is. And it's up to the, the uh, person coming in to adapt themselves to the kitchen. If they want to make changes, they have to come to the then commissioners and then to the advisory board. On it. So I think it's really hard to separate that out. I, I just, I, I think it, we, the kitchen's set up, I'm assuming the kitchen's being done in, a, in a, uh, a format that is the most modern and cost effective and everything like that right now. That's why you would have set it up like this. And um, it's up to then the person coming in to say this is, you know, it's e they can either bid or not bid. Here's your specs. Here's what we have. Generally, when you put out bids like that, you put together what you have, send it out to the people, and then the people come back with what they, they want to do. And you, you break down your percentage of what you're expecting to earn and all that, mm -hmm. having been through several of these leases. Um, but I, I, I don't know, you know, it's an interesting point. I take your point, Councilor, but I don't know if it can really, if it's really practical. Uh, you know, I'm not yep. to say anything, Councilor. I, I appreciate your, your opinion and everything like that, but I, I don't know how you can do it. I, I'm just, but Councilor, uh, I'm done. No, as I was say, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your perspective and I, and I value your experience tremendously. It's just, um, like I was saying to the commissioner, I, I don't disagree w with that point of view. It's just also, um, I also can't sort of like shift in my brain the way that my brain works with this, right? And again, the approach to me has always been, you know, if we're going into a space that's empty and it's a shell, then, you know, we need to have certain things outfitted in that space and that's built into the terms of the lease, right? And so I, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that there's just a different perspective that I have to it. And I just, so I, I appreciate your experience though. And, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, Council Kane. Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight the differences that I see from Councilor Liang's perspective. Um, this is a concession operation. It's not a full service restaurant, right? So I think from where you're coming from, the restaurant business, where you would be looking for specific real estate to fit your restaurant's needs, I don't think this is the same. Uh, this is like what it was before, hot dogs and beverages and a, and a short menu. So I think there are minimal sort of requirements. That's my understanding of this. And Commissioner, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I mean, this is going to be more than what we're doing now, but not quite the Fours restaurant. So, you know, we'd like to provide a decent product up there. Uh, I, I think there is a way to accomplish uh, with Council uh, Liang's concerns about, I don't know if it's tonight by cutting the clubhouse, doing so I think would put us back um, 
by the time we were able to um, develop a, a lease agreement, um, you know, we may be into the summer, which then takes the council into the fall. Um, I do think there is a way to uh, work with the counselor and certainly her expertise in this particular area uh, to build up um, an RFQ with lease language in there that I think that, that meets some of the concerns that she's raised. Um, I would ask that it's not through cutting the clubhouse funding, but through a cooperative uh, work product done um, uh, with the counselor and other voices in, in this space uh, that could protect the city's interest best. On the motion, Council, Council President DeBono. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be on the motion first, um, and then I'll come back when, when the vote is done. Um, you know, I was around for the animal shelter vote originally back in 2016, 17, and then we had to come back at the Apple and COVID happened, and the, the, the price tag obviously inflated based on materials and all these other things. We're, we're gonna be back at square one with possible rebuild, City Council not beating over the summer um, and the timeline of doing all this. Um, we've come to this level. Um, Commissioner Murphy has spoken with many of the residents in the area, along with Councillor Kane. They worked very hard at this. I think we're, we're gonna be backing ourselves in a corner again, as at some point we're gonna have to vote on this. So, I mean, I was around for the animal shelter one. It came back at us and it, it inflated quite a bit. So you gotta look at also funding and then the bid, and then the proper timeline of getting this up and running. Um, I look around the city and I see, you know, what are we doing in particular neighborhoods? This is a great addition to the Furnace Brook golf course and the Forbes Hill improvements. I know this is the clubhouse we're talking about particularly right now, but it blends in with all of it. It's in terrible condition. I've been to many events over there, um, um, and, it, and it, needs, it needs improvements. Um, piggyback a little bit on the president's golf course. Um, I'm an employee, obviously, of Norfolk County, and they've done a lot of improvements over there. They've earmarked funding for playgrounds from, you know, um, state rep Ayers had earmarked $75,000 for, the, for the, um, the playground in that area. The road has been done over there, and they're going to be sitting on $10.4 million when they acquisition sell the courthouse and they're putting it into a capital fund which will be able to pull funding out of that to put into that course i think down the road we also have granite links this this will give an addition for that particular neighborhood um uh, of forbes hill and and all the abutting neighborhoods around there to allow them to to, to get some addition get something for them as well as well as the city on a whole um, we've come a long way with all the additions that we've done out. If we look outside here at Hancock Adams Common to Pageant Field, which I visited just over the weekend for the Flag Day event, um, you know, all the different schools that we've done, Southwest, Central, uh, we're making additions and we're, we're going the, the next, next step, Animal Shelter, and we can go, we can go into private, which Father Bills, we, we, can, we can look around the city and see all the different additions. I think this gives an opportunity for this particular neighborhood to get something. Um, and we've, we've come a long way to get to this level. And the, is the bid in? Is the bid already in? Um, is that a question for Commissioner Murphy? Do you, did you already bid on this at that mark, 9.9 .9 million? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, no, Council. We're preparing the bid documents to be issued uh, pending uh, the Council vote, if the Council votes to appropriate. So we need funds. the vote to bid on it, to get the bid out. Is that correct? The, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You need the funding in place before you. So you need bond authorization. Is that correct? Yeah, we'd prefer it. I mean, there's a timing to this too that is also important. So we're trying to uh, construct this project. I mentioned in the briefing memo I sent last month that there is a uh, certain finesse that we're trying to do to work the most intense work on the shoulders of the season, so that we don't impact the revenue impact uh, the revenue of the golf golf course itself. So. Approval of this um, uh, in June would allow us to bid it in the summer, uh, mobilize in mid-September, start our work, get most of the work done in the uh, tail end of the season and into the early winter, hopefully getting a foundation in the ground uh, before the weather turns on us and then construct the building through uh, the course of uh, 24 uh, with hopefully opening in October or so, or September, October 24. Your timeline is to open, is to be out to bid and have it October, you said? 
Is that correct? Ideally, we would be out to bid in July, July. So bids in August, mobilizing in September and being underway. I mean, that's, that's why we're here tonight. We're here before the break. Um, we only have one more meeting left, which is next Tuesday, and then we go into summer break. We won't reconvene again until September. Um, we've, we've done this before. I did this for the animal shelter. We were right before the summer, not anticipating that we were going to anticipate, you know, all kinds of things happening, COVID happening and pushing the timeline down. We finally got to a vote this past year on the animal shelter. Um, so uh, I think uh, along with Councilor Kane, I'd like to see a vote tonight on this and um, whether you vote on it or not is up to you as a councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, on the motion, we have a motion to cut the, the clubhouse. Councilor McCarthy. Oh yeah, real quick, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be supporting any cut here. Uh, you know, the clubhouse is the foundation and the, the nucleus of, of, of everything that's up there. As Council DeBona just mentioned, um, you know, the clubhouse might look good in the, in the area, the dining area a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's, it's had its, uh, its day. Um, downstairs is, um, needs major assistance downstairs. And um, the, the whole clubhouse itself is the whole, I mean, it's, it's part of the key here on, on, uh, on, on moving this forward, this golf course. So I'm not going to support any cut. I respect Councilor Yang's questions, uh, but um, as you were saying, Mr. Chairman, folks that come in, uh, you know, to, you know, different venues, if they're coming in to, you know, lease and, and work a kitchen, they want to, <clears throat> they want to see a setup. They want to see something that's there. They want to be able to come in and figure out what's the best way um, to um, to improve the dining, improve the service up there. And it might not be exactly what we have on this schematic right now. So um, if we do go ahead and, and um, I don't know if Councillor Kane had made a motion, but if we do make a motion, I won't be supporting any cuts. Okay. Um, on the motion on the cut for Councillor Yang. Anybody else? Okay, seeing no other questions, we're voting right now on cutting, how much money was that? $21,098. Cutting the money from the clubhouse, $9,021,098 from the budget. Um, so we have a vote, and I'm gonna ask the, uh, the clerk to, the clerk to, the, the clerk of committees to read the roll. Council Andronico? No. Council Kane? No. Council Devine? No. Council DeBona? No. Council Harris? No. Council Yang? Yes. Council Mahoney? Yes. Council McCarthy? No. Chairman Fallon? No. Motion fails two to seven. Okay. Okay, motion carries two to seven. Okay, um, now we're back on the original motion, and I believe the first hand I saw was Council Devine. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I want to thank you uh, about a little more than almost two weeks ago. You gave me time to uh, go through all the numbers and what was going on with the clubhouse. Uh, and you're very busy with what was going on with pageant field and all the things. So I appreciate it. Uh, would you be able to go to uh, the lower level on the screen? I, uh, we didn't talk about it, but when you had mentioned you, we, t we talked about the simulators. Uh, there's another golf course in the, uh, in the area that um, they remove someone from their office to put the simulator in because it's such a, a valuable asset to them. And then this, over the weekend when I was reviewing this and I saw that there was four simulator rooms, I was extremely impressed. Uh, I think that's huge. It's going to really do really well for uh, hopefully for us. So uh, I commend you for that. And then I wanted to say thank you to all the people that came in tonight. Uh, taking your time and from what I've been hearing that you've been very active working with the commissioner. Um, that's important. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. They don't commit their time. And uh, I'm really happy to see that you all worked really well with the commissioner and you went to all these multiple meetings. So um, thank you very much. Uh, it helps us make the decisions to do what we need to do. And I believe that we've come to a position where I think everybody's happy. So thank you, and uh, that's it. On the motion to pass, we're gonna to go to Council McCarthy and then to Council Mahoney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 
<clears throat> following uh, Councilor Devine's comments on those simulators, uh, there'll be a line uh, all winter and a, uh, a waiting list to get in up there, which is great. And, and uh, it'll be a revenue, uh, it'll be uh, a big revenue maker. But the one thing I want to mention, when we do projects, no matter what it is, if it's Quarry Hills, if it's a... Um, you know, a, uh, the animal shelter, is, as Councilor DeBona mentioned. But one of the big things that jumped out at me, Dave, um, was the community. I mean, you really championed this. Um, I know the members uh, were, you know, and the Furnace Brook folks were talking about this a few years back with the administration, and everybody was getting on board. But you really did an excellent job. We had, we had folks in here that had concerns, and... You know, I, I look at it and really um, it was the Dave Murphy show in regards to, and Ian Kane, um, in regards to those community um, meetings that took place. I mean, you really grabbed that by the horns and I mean, you had, you listen to these, these workshops, the walk in the park. I know that Councillor Kane was involved in it also with you, but um, uh, it really got everything banged out in regards to the disagreements that were going on in regards to parking and and trees and how many trees and how many spots and etc. And uh, you know it's going to be a beautiful venue up there and uh, it's going to be great for the folks that have been up there for years, for new members and and for the entire city. Uh, so um, hats off um, to you, Mr. Murphy, uh, um, for um, really doing a great job with this whole project. Thank you. Okay, Council Mahoney. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions. So um, why are we bringing this in together, like the Forbes Hill Park and then the golf course? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. It's been part of the discussion with the community the whole time. So all of our community meetings, there's been an equal uh, interest in park improvements. So everybody... Um, initially wanted to know why we were focused on the golf course and that's why we went to CPC originally to try to make some improvements to the park okay. and then the subsequent meetings that we've had the community workshops there was a lot of focus on yeah. making improvements to the park we're working very closely with folks like uh, Dave Potter uh, Maria Mulligan yep. um, Chris Lebo a bunch of others that are that formed the friends of Forbes Hill Park so yep. that's the reason why we're here so I guess the reason why I'm asking that is because right now when I'm looking at your projected budget you have Forb Hill, Forb Hills tower repairs which was an added added piece since the original piece that you were talking about and that's two hundred fifty thousand dollars and then Forbes Hill Park improvements a hundred thousand dollars correct yes and that hundred is on top of the 350 we received from CPC in this body so you already received 350 mm -hmm. so so you received 350 from I'm sorry from the Community Preservation Act already, right? right? So I guess I guess just because you already got it from CPC, I would say that why can't we get the other 350 from CPC and cut this out? Because that's that's money that's that people already pay their taxes for that go into it. So I'm just asking that question because you already I know that originally I think you were asking for 500,000 at CPC and then you pulled it back to 350. I can't remember exactly because it's been a long this has been a long road. So. And I'm, I'm, and I'm just asking this question because this, this budget is very big. And if we were able to take some of this money out and put it into CPC, it would be, we wouldn't be bonding it. So it would be less money that we're bonding. We would be putting it to CPC, taxes that are already collected from people's, people's taxes that we we're, were able to use for that person. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Uh, conceptually, we could, Councilor. Um, I think there's a timing issue. Um, you know, I one of the commitments we made was to address the park in the context of the golf course. That's why they're married together through the appropriation process. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that could prevent us from separating that. But I think uh, out of respect for the feedback that we've received, we've mm -hmm. connected these two projects. Um, and that's why the appropriation request has them both in there. Now, there's and nothing that could, there's nothing to stop us from pulling that out and saying, you know, we're going to go into the next CPC funding round cycle. We could do that. When's the next funding cycle for the CPC next year? They've done it annually, but they've had um, they've had off cycle meetings in the past. Well, I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, Dave, that this is not something that this. So I'm going to back up for a second. So one of the things that I'm very frustrated, and this is this is this is it might sound like it's towards you, but it's just in general. So January, February, March, I want to do the little song in April, May, June, July. So April 24th, we started having meetings from January, February, March. We had council meetings that we literally were here for 10 minutes. We would drive across the city to come here. We would open it up, and then 
um, President DeVoto would hold up the book and say, we have lots of things to get done in this book because we weren't having meetings. The administration could have come in January, February, March, April. We could have had multiple conversations. This is the second to last meeting of the council year before we go for break. And we're here tonight talking about $14 million. Had you come, and I know, they, it, I know that there was an RFP back in February for the, um, maybe you can help me. What was that for? Because I have a pile of stuff here. What was that for, Dave? RFP for $12 million back in February. What was that for? I'm not sure what you're referring to, Council. You're not sure? Okay. Give me a second. So there was an RFP back in February, and it was for, oh, here it is. February 16th, 2023. Um, owner's project manager for the construction of the clubhouse maintenance facility of Brunswick Golf Course. Mm -hmm. Estimated total cost of this project, $12 million. What's this? That was a uh, OPM solicitation for the project to bring on a project manager. Do we have that now? We do not have a project manager on board because the uh, costs uh, of the outside project managers were, were very high. So Public Buildings has a certified individual that's been working with us on the project. Okay, so we're not going to get an OP. We're not going to get that. Not so, an outside OPM, but we yeah, do have so, an OPM. So I know you've been working on this very long and hard, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that this is something that we could have discussed, could have been discussed even with the friends of Forbes Hill Park and said, you know, this is, because we didn't know what the numbers were. What we did know is that, that the tower was going to be done. It's not really going to be done. It's just going to be, it's going to be repointed and the roof's going to be done, but it's not, you're not taking the lining out, right? So it's really small money. So this small money, 250000 and $100,000, could have very easily, if we were ahead of this bond and not coming in the second to last meeting of the year, we could have discussed it with another public meeting saying, we're going to get this done and that we're going to get it from CPA money. So I'm going to explain to you where we're going to get this from instead of combining it into this big budget of 14, almost $14 million. So I, I, I don't want to prolong this because it's, there's bigger pieces here. The other thing is back in 2021, you came before us when we were first taken over the, the, the golf course and your estimate for redoing the clubhouse was, do you remember what that number was? It was about five and a half million, but it was a different project. It was about what, sorry? Five and a half million. I think five and a half to six million. Five and a half to six million dollars. And it was what? It was a different project. We've what was, changed What was different about it? The, the community planning process has is, is that, it's skyrocketed from the community because you're saying that's that part of it, and we've had some inflation. I, I know we've all aware of that. So, so I mean, so, costs have increased. So it's doubled quite a bit. in price. No, it's a different project, and we've had some significant inflation. But it's not really because we saw this project. The only difference was is it was a little bit further down. It was on top of where the building was going to be. So I think the square footage. I could be wrong, but the square footage looks about the same. The size of the building is about the same size as what you were presenting back when we first started this back in 2021. So the price that you had estimated for five or six million dollars has now grown to almost 14 million dollars. So, so I don't des I, I definitely don't agree with them because the size is the same. What's the square footage of this building? Uh, the square footage I think is. Because that's not in your plans. I couldn't see it anywhere anyway. I think it's about 12,000 square feet council. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask a couple of other questions. So what's the percentage, so when we were looking at the, the budget, when you're looking at um, how many members, how many of the members, how many, total, how many total, total members do you have in this golf course? Uh, including junior members, we're up to 278. And how many did you have when you first started? Uh, I'd have to get that report. It was less. We've upped the uh, member numbers. I guess, I guess when you took it over from before the city of Quincy was running it, you don't know the numbers? I think right? there was approximately 248 or so. We're up so about we, 30. we brought it up by about 30 members. Mm -hmm. so What's far. the percentage of the members that come from Quincy? So um, it's, there are 278 members. I think there are uh, 158 members from Quincy and 120 uh, non-residents. And what we've done is uh, the folks that were pulling off, we have a pretty active waiting list and the folks that were pulling off the waiting list are all Quincy residents. So, so we're endeavoring to grandfather in the non-residents and add residents to our new membership. Okay, so, and how long does a membership last? Just out of curiosity. It's an, basically an annual permit. God bless you, God bless you. So it's, it's an annual membership, is that what you're saying? Yes. So, um, so if somebody doesn't renew, then you have a waiting list for Quincy residents. We have a waiting list and depending on, we, we analyze every year what the right number is uh, for uh, memberships. Obviously we'd like to increase memberships, 
because it's increased revenue. Right. But we have to be cognizant of the value of that membership to the existing members to make sure that we can still provide a benefit for that membership in order to cap that number at a certain amount so that tournaments and uh, premium hours and the other benefits that the members get doesn't get flooded with new members and therefore we end up losing members. So let me ask you another question. So if I want to golf and I'm just a resident of the city of Quincy and I'm not, um, I'm not a member, when do I get to golf? So the only restrictions on that time, there are premium hours on Friday afternoons, Saturday mornings and early afternoons, and Sunday mornings and early afternoons. So essentially you could golf seven days a week depending on uh, the time that you were going golfing. So we have about 60% of our members that are actually from Quincy. And if you're a non-member, you can golf on the weekends at 2 p.m., which is the warmest time of the day to golf. I'm not a golfer, but that's the time that we can golf. And then I think there's two hours um, from 8 to 10 on 8 to 10 a.m. on Fridays that you can golf. Monday through third, Thursdays, unless restricted by use by leagues or tournaments, you can golf. But then when I looked at the calendar, it looks like there's a lot of tournaments. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of free time for people to golf, which, which the concern I have with this is there's $14 million that we're going to put to this golf, to, to this golf, um, this, this, the renovations of this golf. But it's, it's, it's not really, not everybody can use, use it because of the way it's like. So I went over to President's Golf Course to take a look at President's Golf Course to do the same kind of model to see what it was modeled after. This seems to be more modeled after like the use is more like granite links where it's like limited to the, limited to the people unless you're a member. Presence is a little bit more open and they don't have, they, they do have, they do have tournaments that happen up there too, but they're not quite as, it's not quite as booked up as it is. It seems like there's more free, but it's probably because it's an 18 hole golf course. So that's the other thing. So I, I'm not by any means trying to pretend that I'm a golfer because I, it's, I recognize some of the golfers in the audience. I'm not a golfer, but I know you golf with my sister. So, so, but the reason why I'm bringing that up is I'm, I'm just trying to understand that too. So could you explain that? Like what's it modeled after? And then what's the end, when's the, what's the end result with the bond that we're taking out? Are we hoping that, I think you said it, but I want you to repeat it. Are we hoping that this pays for itself? Yes, I mean the useful life of the asset is anywhere from seventy-five to hundred years. So, I think seventy-five the, to hundred. What? Sorry. Seventy-five to hundred years, years on the clubhouse facility itself, uh, and you have you have to factor in depreciation, maintenance, etc. So it's not as a direct line, but you know our rough estimates, um, and I would defer to Munify to to back this up uh, conservatively is thirty-five to forty years, an ROI based on our revenue projections. Yeah, but the but you say so you're saying it's going to pay for itself, but then also the administration saying yes, well, whenever revenue we get in, we'll throw it to the bond. But that doesn't it's not really how it works because the revenue we get in, we spend someplace else unless we actually put in the bond that revenues from the golf course are going to pay off the bond. Um, so, so we went from a five and a half million dollar to six million dollar clubhouse to uh, an, almost twelve million dollars. Then we have these the simulators are 195. How much do you think that's going to? How much do you think we're going to charge people to use the simulators? I'm assuming, right? Absolutely. How much are you going to charge people to use the simulators? Uh, we're going to take a look at um, the area rates, but um, you know, typically they cost as much as a round of golf. Pardon me? Uh, they cost as much as a round of golf, so they could be you know, $40, $50 an hour for those simulators. Um, you know, we'll be running leagues. Uh, they, they present themselves a wide range of opportunities. Uh, all of the courses that have put them in, um, quite frankly, are looking um, to them for great revenue and potentially adding additional um, simulators because not only are they very useful during the winter months, but um, whether it be rainy days or after dusk, they can also be used. Right, and probably be a great place to bring kids you know, have a burger. Well, it's also it's also very helpful for teaching too. Yeah, so. and teaching. Yep. Um, so the other thing that I had a question for this this is a stand low building. It's in the middle of. Um, it's got direct sunlight, right? It's got lots of natural light that's going to be hitting this building. Is it going to have solar panels on it? So um, I think Tony mentioned that it's going to be solar ready. We've talked to Shelley about meeting with the city's solar partner. Mm -hmm. So the discussion we're going to have with them is whether golf balls and solar panels make good companions. So the concern would be, depending on where we situate the solar panels on the building, uh, whether or not um, they would be subject to uh, damage uh, being in a golf course and being in mm. close proximity. This is a pretty tight site all around, and we're trying to keep the clubhouse in its current place. Uh, it's one of the adjustments that we've made. Um, we're endeavoring to put solar on the roof, um, and 
tackle a lot of the issues that Tony mentioned, uh, but we still have to meet with our solar partners to make that um, final decision. So Shelly wasn't part of this planning, that, that, like all of the work that you've done. So Shelly, was she part of it? Was she at the table? So I, I, I keep hearing that through some of the emails that we get from folks. I know, that's why I'm asking. And I know our project team had talked to her, her early on. I've had uh, repeated discussions with her since those emails started to circulate about getting, getting some input from her on various aspects, including the solar partner, including yeah. the EV charging station. Yeah. So um, I, I think... Yeah. I guess the reason why I'm bringing that, it doesn't matter if you got emails or not. I was hoping that maybe you would have already had those conversations. So the fact that you're saying you got those emails, it's so great. Our, but, I, but I think... Yeah, so our, our yeah. partners have that same skill set um, as Shelly does. So I respect the work that Shelly does. And she's working on quite a bit of uh, a number of projects for the city. Um, but we also have other folks that are looking at those same issues. Yeah, no. It's not as if Shelly wasn't involved. So we weren't looking at sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability was part of the discussion, as Tony mentioned, throughout this entire process. You seem a little tense about that one, though. I'm sorry. No, so so honest. the other question I had is about traffic. What was the traffic study that was done up there? Because I know that I do appreciate that you've moved the parking into the original parking area, because I know that was a big issue with a lot of the neighbors that were up there. And I, there's a lot of there's a, sorry, I really appreciate everybody's here that's here tonight as well. But there's a lot of people that participated in this as well as in regards to some of the redesigns that Mr. Murphy has gone through. So I know this has been a long, long leg, but I'm just trying to understand um, that. So for a traffic study, because I think that was another big concern, the traffic in and the traffic out. Because you just maybe I don't know what slide is, but maybe explain um, how the traffic's going to work. Sure. So one of the discussions we had uh, with the community is the a more equitable distribution of the traffic. Uh, so right now, um, the driveway that heads down towards Summit is in uh, significant disrepair to the point where uh, only the bravest of souls uh, would use that uh, yeah, in any would, capacity. Some of our streets in Quincy are like that, just so you know. <laughs> but, but that one's particularly bad. <laughs> so that is going to be used as a one-way driveway, uh, and that will go out uh, to Summit. But uh, the broader issue, um, uh, Ali Rula, our traffic engineer, um, did an excellent job in her presentation. And she has uh, a, a few orders that I think are coming before the council, uh, I believe in June. Uh, but just to summarize her recommendations uh, mm -hmm. from the traffic study that she made, she's talking about providing a stop sign in the northbound direction at Reservoir Myopia to make that intersection an all-way stop. Uh, provide additional visibility treatments for the stop condition at Reservoir Myopia. At an all-way stop condition at Forbes Hill in Stony Bray, I know that was an issue that came up repeatedly at our um, public meetings. Um, at a crosswalk spanning Beale Street in the area of Forbes Hill Road and Summit Ave to improve pedestrian connectivity to the golf course and to provide annual monitoring of the neighborhood, including collection of speed and volume data um, as we continue. Okay. And they've also, um, one of the issues that came up to community meetings was the signal at Beale and Adams and uh, they've upgraded the detection system already to improve the traffic flow there too. What about the, um, that's Bale and Adams, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, this I'm thinking when it comes out onto Adams, what's, is that, that's not Bale, is that, I forget what it's called. What that's Where the reservoir comes out? Is it res yeah. yeah. Is, there, what's, is there anything gonna be done there because that's also a tough corner for people to come out at? I think that that is an existing stop sign. Uh, this is an existing yeah. stop sign, yeah. Sometimes people don't stop at it. Um, so just to, to go back a little bit more too. So will you be, so the functions you'll be able to have, you said you're not gonna be having functions, but then you said, but then there'll be some functions like baby showers or birthday parties or anniversary parties. Those are functions, right? Yeah, I did not say that we weren't gonna have functions. I think the functions um, that that building will host will have to be primarily golf related, related to tournaments uh, that folks have up there. Um, and historically the functions that people have had up there have been birthday party, baby shower, that don't conflict with the other use of the right. facility. I wouldn't want to have a Saturday afternoon birthday party while the golf course is full. Um, you know, I, I think the way that this has to be managed has to be cognizant of the neighborhood's needs as well. It has to be what? I'm sorry. Cognizant of the neighborhood's needs. Yeah, the reason why I bring it up is because they, that the, uh, they were just, and this was not, well, it was managed by the city of Quincy, but you're developing out, and this is kind of going towards what Councilor Yang was talking about, the restaurant, whether it's the Fours or whoever. I understand, like, I understood where she was coming from with that because you're building this out, so you have a current lease with somebody and you're building something out. I would think the conversations would be had with the current, even though you're not in the negotiations for the RFP for that lease, but you could basically be pricing out what you think the price is going to be for the next lease. I think that's a, I'm not trying to speak for counseling, but I think that's what I was getting from that conversation was that, you know, we don't have to wait until 20, 
2024 when it opens or when 2025 when the lease ends, we can start having those conversations of what we anticipate those prices are going to go up to. No different than saying that our membership fees are going to go up or how much are we going to pay for the simulators. Those are the conversations. That's, I think that's, that's what I was getting from that conversation. Um, and I guess I would also want to know for those functions, if you're able to have those functions, whether it's you know renting it for a baby shower or renting it for a birthday party or an anniversary party. I'm just using those as examples because those are the things that I've been invited to to go up there. So when you're having those functions, and I believe back when those things happened, you brought your food in from outside. Would the fours then be, I, this, this would be something as the manager of a golf course that you're going to spend $14 million on that I would think that you're thinking these through to figure out what the cost incentives are going to be to be able to offset the $14 million that you're asking the taxpayers of the city of Quincy once again to fork yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And have you thought of those? Yes, we have. So what are they? So the policy would be that we're not going to be conducting or hosting events during uh, the peak golf season. So if you wanted to have a birthday party in November or December, mm -hmm. that's different than having one in June or July. So we have thought this through. It's, in, it's actually in place right now. We've mm -hmm. turned down different events that want to come in there during peak golf season and, and told them they'll have to look for another okay. location. Because So how much does gonna... it cost to rent a non-peak non -peak times to be able to have a function at the golf? I, I don't have that in front of me, Council. I'll so, get that to you. But I would think that while you're doing out the... So, we, so you did the... You know, it, and none of that, so that, that's the other thing in your budget, your projected budget. I didn't see anything there for that kind of income to come in, I, unless you can show me where that is, because we have income ATM, bank interest, cart fees, dues, revenues, F and B, is it, maybe it's, nope, that's um, F and B rental fees, what, um, is, that the, is that that piece? That's food and beverage. The other piece, room, room rental fee is the, the showers and birthday okay, So room right? rental fees, are the, so, okay, so, so you don't have an anticipated cost of what you might be for this new, new it, it will be about the same. You think about $4,000 worth of room rental fees? I would anticipate it being slightly higher only because the quality of the room is increasing. Um, but again, that's a discussion that we're two years away, um, a year away from having. I guess the reason why I'm asking that is like, how do we know that our financial plan, your budget for running the golf course will be sufficient that the city taxpayers will not be on the hook to add for additional funds in the future? Because we do, some of your budget does come from the general operational budget. So my concern is, is that, you know, we're going to, because we're going to pay, it's going to pay for your, it's, the theme is that the theme that we're getting here is it's going to pay for itself. But this other piece that we're having is that we're going to spend $14 million on this and we don't have certain things that have fig been figured out. So I'm kind of concerned about that because when it doesn't pay for itself, it's not like a regular business where, you know, you either go take a loan or it's going to come back to the taxpayers of the city of Quincy. So that's my concern. So, so what I would say to that counselor is that I, I would suggest that it's going to pay for itself, but even if it were not to pay for itself, that the council should support this. We have a number of assets in our park inventory that don't pay for themselves. They're investments in the quality of life in this community. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest this, this clubhouse yeah. and this golf course is similar. Yeah, that, so then that's, that's another debate, though, because that you know, there's other departments in the city of Quincy that don't pay for themselves that go for the quality of life. 60% of this is this is memberships that are playing up there and not everybody plays golf. So it's, I'm I'm going to go back to the fact that your members you still have you still have a majority of people who are not from Quincy. And it's a concern of mine because I, it was a concern of mine back when we were talking about this because we're going to get into the business we're getting into the business of golf and we we're asking the taxpayers now to 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 buckle up for another 14 million dollars. So that's the reason why I'm bringing this up because it's it's not an incentive for everybody in the city of Quincy. There's 370 members or 270 members that, that play up there, and then there's people who come up and golf, but not everybody golf. So this is definitely one of those things that's a it's a one-off thing. So we have to really look at it at a different lens. And I understand where we're going. On the golf course itself, do we have any other uses? For, not the park, just strictly the golf course. Are there was there any development for any other resources for any other things other than golf? I don't know that I understand your question. So you have a golf course, you have some, you have some areas, not in the park, I'm not talking about the park, I'm not talking about the Forbes Hill Park, I'm just talking about the golf course area. Is there, was there areas for pickleball courts? Was there area for, I think people came back to you and said, what's the, what's the winter season months that you could do? Was there any other use for the golf course other than just golf in the winter? I mean, yeah. the, in the summer months? Not in the summer months, in the winter months, it's one of the most popular sledding locations in the city. No, I know that. So, we, but, the but were, were there any golf. other, are there any other revenue ways that you could raise money to do, to use the, the golf course in the winter time for other things? I'm asking because it's just another, it's just another use that you've, that's been thought of for the. No. Okay. Okay. And then, um, how do we ensure like that? So, cause we've talked about this and this is a real question. So how do we ensure 
we came before us before, and we talked about how this was going to pay for itself, how this was going to be that it was you know it's going to be a revenue generator for the city of Quincy. And we I don't think the money that's, that went into like the air, the irrigation system and stuff is that part of is this part of your budget too? Are we paying for that? No, that's separate. That's separate. So the city of Quincy has already paid for the irrigation. In a different was it a different bond? I believe that was um, uh, ban money. Pardon me? I think that was ban money. I defer to Mr. Mason. Okay, so, so, there's, so there's already been money invested into the golf course, and we don't know how much that is, and we're, this is going to be another... We do. It was a million dollars for new irrigation system, and that came in really handy um, when Furnace Brook was one of the uh, few courses last summer during the drought that didn't completely burn out, and we were generating revenue where other golf courses were not. So, but that million dollars, so what I'm saying is when we say it pays for itself on top of the $14 million in a business outside, you know, in, the, in the real world, when we do things, we have to actually kind of figure out all the money that we're spending and how we're going to pay for it. In a municipality, when we're doing this, it's like it's generating income and where it's going to pay for itself, but we're not actually keeping track of all this. So I guess, how do we ensure that these prices don't escalate the $14 million right now? Because you came before us and told us it was going to be $6 million and it was COVID and it's changed and it's now $14 million. So I'm concerned about things escalating because also when we use the example of the animal shelter that's being built, I think we hit some contamination that we didn't know. We have no idea how much that's costing. I'm sure it's going to come in budget, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so how do we know that, that we're not going to run into any issues? What I would suggest to that, uh, Counselor, our best insurance against that is timing. Our, um, our price estimates are about three weeks old. If we're out to bid uh, by next month, we do have uh, a small escalation contingency already in there. Uh, I do not expect uh, to have to come back for additional money. What's the, what is, I'm sorry, the small, I, I don't know why I can't hear you tonight, Dave. I really am having a hard time hearing you. What is the small, what? You, you, There's an escalation it, contingency. Okay, um, how much is that? I didn't see that. So in our breakdown, um, oh, it's it's five hundred eighty-two thousand. Is it five hundred eighty-two thousand? Five hundred eighty-two is the owner's contingency. There's okay. also a construction contingency built into the um, eleven six five eight figure as well too. I don't know if you heard that, Council, but there Sorry. was a two point three escalation, uh, two point three percent escalation um, allowance in there as well, too. So it was a two point three percent escalation. What's that in dollars? The escalation contingency was uh, forty-five thousand two hundred and thirty-seven. And the design contingency was 75647 And that was on top of the 5% uh, owner contingency of the 582034. So this is my last question. So I just have to ask this question because we came in with a budget, which I wasn't in favor of this back because when we didn't even have a budget back when we were saying that we're going to take this over. And we came in with a budget and we said it was going to be five or six million dollars. Then we thought it was going to go up to, because I think when we had the neighbors and we started talking, we thought it was going to be like seven million. So we went five to six. I remember the number seven million being that, not this one, but the one that was going to be where the golf course club, the clubhouse is right now, it was around seven, correct? Am I remembering that number correctly? It went from five to six to maybe seven. This sounds about right. So now, and that was just a year ago. So now we're at. So we have 13, 14 million dollars. I'm just going to round it up to 14 million dollars. So this has grown. Ask, ask, so did, did anybody ever say? I just have to ask this question. When you were de designing this, did you say, "We have eight million dollars"? What, what does that look like? What does eight million dollars look like for the for this? Or did we just say, "Let's just go ahead and build it, and we'll see what it comes in"? Because you know what, the taxpayers of the city of Quincy are very generous, and they have no problem saying yes to everything that the, that we put in front of the city council. So I really need to understand: are, Did we try to stay in budget, or did it just escalate and grow? 
So budget was an original projection, which you're referring to as budget. Five to six what, million what, dollars. What the goal here was to build a functional, practical building that serves the city best. And I think that's where we arrived, Councilor. Okay. So, so I don't think there's anything extravagant. I don't think there's anything. The one thing um, I will say is it should be cut from it. We do a lot of projects in the city of Quincy and we don't finish all of the project we start. And we're still waiting for the, the Mass Maritime Center down in House Neck because that was just, we started it, that stopped, and now that's just dead. But, you know, and we have a lot of ideas what's going on here. But we can't stay in a budget. We can say five to six, maybe it's seven, now we're 12, now we're 14. And we're meeting the needs. We're always saying we're meeting the needs. But there's never, uh, there's never like we're just going to make a, you know, we're going to make a conservative, we're going to be conservative of what we're doing. Everything has to be at the top of the line for everything that we're doing. I'm not saying, this is beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. I just think that we, we owe it to the taxpayers of the city of Quincy because the, they're the ones that are going to be on the hook. So when the economy goes down, people aren't golfing or people aren't using the simulators at some point, whether it's next year or in 20 years, at some point, this is all going to come to roost and we're going to have to pay for it. And the people who don't golf in the city of Quincy don't want to spend this kind of money. So I just feel like every project that we come before us, it's, it starts at a, hey, it's going to be five or six, seven. We could probably get away with 14. So I think you know where I'm going with this, Dave. I just think it's a ridiculous the amount of money that we're spending all over the city for every project that we do. We don't come in and conservative. We don't cut anything. It comes in, you know, wherever we can, we're just putting more and more into something. And it's very frustrating to me. So I'm glad that you worked so hard with the neighbors. But I still think they still asked. There was one other thing that they asked that was really frustrating to me. They did ask for another public forum to be able to talk to you because they thought you were going to come back with these plans before it came before the city council. And you wouldn't do it. That's, that's a fact. And we didn't have a public forum for this, for people to come up and actually speak. And if we did, we would have all these lovely people that would come up and speak in favor, and we would have had a few people that didn't. So I'm very frustrated with that as well. So I, I think $14 million is just an excessive amount of money to be able, and there's, there's, in every project we come before us, it's excessive. And the taxpayers of the city of Quincy are on the hook, and 60% of these people right now are, you know, we're paying for a lot of people. It's really no different than Quincy College in some ways. And you can tell me in five or six years, it will be 100% of them are members. But the numbers are reverse, Council. I, th I think a couple of times you've mentioned that the majority of them are non-residents. Pardon me? I, I think you've mentioned a couple of times the majority are non-residents. The majority are residents. No, 60 per, I said what, 60%. I said 60. It's not 100%. Is what, I said. What, what they all have in common is they all help create the revenue that funds what we're talking about, what we're concerned about, the economic The taxpayers model. of the city of Quincy are the ones that are on the hook, Dave. It's not about the members or who's there. I'm talking about the taxpayers of the city of Quincy are going to be the ones that are on the hook, whether they play golf or don't. And the if they do play golf, they the won't be able to play golf because model. there's a lot of tournaments that are going on. So I don't think this model is actually created in a way that's actually, it's, it's actually feasible for the taxpayers of the city of Quincy. And that's what's frustrating to me is that when I'm looking at this and even how you're bringing in the money and how things are happening, when you're talking about a restaurant that you're going to put in and it's going to cost more money, we have no idea how much, how much we're going to be able to get. We don't know how much you're going to get for functions. We don't know. We, don't, we haven't projected any of those things out that would be able to offset the cost of what we're going to be able to borrow against. And those are the things that I would have thought that we would be along. You can project what your income is going to be through your members. We can also project what you're, what, what you're hoping for, for generating revenue from that new lease that you're going to have this new build out for, because you already have a customer that's in there that is probably going to be your long-term customer. You also have an opportunity to be able to increase those function fees. We do it all the time for the schools. It costs a ton of money for parents to be able to, or, 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 or um, sports facilities to be able to rent any of our functions around here. It goes up all the time. So it's just, it, those things aren't there. I can't support the cost that's going to cost the taxpayers for this number because it's just too, it's too expensive. And it's not going to be value and engineered down. It's going to, it's, 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 it's just too expensive. You came before us and told us five to $6 million. A year later, it was seven or eight. Now we're at 14. It just keeps growing. So it's, it's okay because you're going to get it, but it's not going to be for me. So thank you. Councilor. Um, any other councilors? The, the council chair would like to take a minute. Um, one of the things I think that gets lost in here is that the golfers, we've, we've got the numbers on what's coming in, and it's fairly consistent. Like the, you, you're paying for your entire operation by what's coming in in fees. That pays enough. Um, and we're also looking at, we're also looking at, excuse me, I have the floor, please. I, I allowed you to go. I have the floor. Thank you. Um, that these are paying, basically, it's pretty much paying for itself, just looking at the numbers. Would that be an accurate statement? From an operating revenue standpoint, Councillor, we've presented, um, I think, at our budget meeting, uh, a picture for what each fiscal year looks like. 
I think uh, Mr. Mason has submitted a borrowing schedule yes. um, that talks about uh, including borrowing costs uh, about $19.5 million. If you look at the uh, net revenue surplus on an annual basis and factor in some of the uh, potential <coughs> increases with the new facility uh, versus the existing facility, uh, over the course of time, um, this will be revenue positive. Now, again, I would suggest to the council that um, you know, whether it's the dog park or the floor of the clubhouse or some of the many other great facilities that have the quality of life here, um, you know, we, we make certain facilities kind of dance for their supper and other facilities don't have to. So I do think that over the course of time, there is a positive revenue picture here, but I would ask that you consider this as much a quality of life uh, asset as it is a revenue opportunity. Yeah, obviously, I think that that has to take an effect. And to say, I think one thing that's important to say is this is not an unusual business for cities and towns. I do golf a lot. Uh, you can go over to Braintree. You go over to the South Shore Country Club, which is run owned by the town of Hingham. Uh, there are several golf courses around that are run by towns. I mean, if you go down, going down the Cape, Brockton, Boston has golf courses. There are several cities and towns just, just in the immediate area that there are municipal owned golf courses and that. I would rather be putting a golf course there than putting another development there. Yeah. So um, I think it's to take, I, I think there was a problem the way we did it before with Furnace Brook Golf Course, to be honest with you. I was never happy with that arrangement. And I'm kind of the one, I also pushed the mayor. I wanted to see the city take it <coughs> over. And particularly for the kids, for the, 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 the high school golf teams. And now we have a home for the women's golf team, which I think is very important that they all play on the same playing field and that they're all using the same thing. And I think this is a great opportunity for the city. Um, I will be voting in favor of it. And um, I'm gonna, any other councils on the motion? We have a motion on the floor to vote. Uh, I'm gonna, it's to vote for the, for the bond for the Francisburg Golf Course. I'll act to ask the clerk of committees to read the roll. Councilor Andronico. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Yang. No. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Chairman Phelan. Yes. Seven members of council. Seven, seven members, Paul, the, the matter passes. Okay, yep. thank, thank you. Much appreciated, sir. Okay, uh, moving on to the next item. We're gonna take up the appropriation for the capital improvement plan for public buildings. And I believe we have uh, Mr. Hines in the audience to come up and make a presentation. Good evening, councilors and committee members. Um, as you stated, Mr. President, I am here for the uh, $4.5 million appropriation for the Department of Public Buildings capital improvements. Uh, by and large, this funding is for the replacement of the boilers in the domestic hot water plant at North Quincy High School, um, as well as uh, significant structural repairs to the building that is the, the Kennedy Center, our senior center. Um, the numbers presented, uh, the documentation to back them up was uh, shared with the council members previously. Um, and the North Quincy High School budget is based upon an actual bid that we have received back. Uh, and the Kennedy set of numbers are based upon professional cost estimating. Um, I'd like to say up front that when we did come in uh, most recently for capital funding, we did include a million dollars for the North Quincy High School boilers at that time. Um, our original projections uh, held reasonably true. Uh, it was quite some time ago that we did come in for that funding uh, with the price escalations and uh, inflation. Uh, the bid for that aspect of the work came at $1.3 million. 
Um, in addition to that, the consultants and engineers that told us um, previously about the need to do the domestic hot water system uh, really expedited the urgency of that. And uh, we elected to do that, uh, include that in the bid for a couple of reasons. Uh, the most significant of which is ultimately cheaper for us to do it now while the boiler room work is happening, uh, owing to abatement costs, demolition costs, uh, and the fact that between the exit and the domestic hot water system would be the new boilers. So they would impact access to do that later job. So the bids we received back for the totality of the work in the North Quincy boiler room is $1.7 million. Um, the Kennedy Center uh, was built in the early 1950s as the Miles Standish Elementary School. Uh, after Proposition 2 and a half, it closed. It was leased out to the Quincy Elks as their home for a number of years. Uh, and then Beachwood by the Bay uh, occupied that once they were vacated out of the Beachwood Knoll School. Um, Mayor Koch established the Kennedy Center uh, early on in his administration there. Um, as part of our due diligence and looking at the structures, because uh, it was built over a salt marsh and uh, other filled tidal lands, uh, we sent some engineers in there and they found issues not with the foundation or the beams or the grade beams or the major portions of the foundation, but the supports of the first floor slab itself. If you can imagine the construction, it's much like a parking garage with precast forms where they're shaped like a T. Uh, and many times if you see an overpass at a, of a bridge and a highway, you'll see that the concrete is broken and the steel rebar that's within that concrete is rusted. And when that concrete uh, is impacted by the rusting rebar, uh, it fractures because the rebar expands when it rusts. So it breaks off uh, the concrete and exposing the rebar to the further moisture and further deterioration. Uh, it's actually the opinion of the engineers who surveyed the building that by and large, the problem with the building was a matter of a poor quality of original construction. Uh, and it's just exacerbated with time and uh, it is accelerating. Um, we had one engineering firm go in initially who, um, really, really was concerned and wanted us to close the building on the spot. I knew that was excessive. We brought in another firm who told us it is urgent, it is accelerating, it does need to be repaired, and it needs to be repaired sooner rather than later, but we didn't need to lock the door. Um, but in doing the assessments, doing the design, doing the plans and getting it ready to bid, you know, close to a year has passed. So there's another year of that acceleration. Uh, so we are proposing to do that full re, uh, full repair. The um, problem with that, and I've got pictures if anyone's really interested, as I said, it was built on a marsh. It's really a nasty, nasty condition under that building. It's mud, it's swampy, there's snakes. Um, we have a heavy contingency in the project budget uh, owing to those conditions. Um, we just feel that we're going to be paying significantly because of the job conditions. We have opened up the foundation in a number of places to provide access, to prevent, to provide ventilation, to allow emergency egress, um, but it is what it is. It's, it's just nasty under there. Uh, and we're quite honestly really hopeful that someone will even bid to build it, uh, to do the repairs. Um, so we are doing outreach to firms that do the concrete work, a number of them that do like marine pairs and stuff like that, they're used to the wet swampy areas um, to increase the pool of people who uh, would be available to bid for the work. Council Liang. Thank you, I'd like to, to approve and then if I could on the motion. Okay. Motion to approve. Um, so Council Liang. Thank you. Our motion. Whoa, it's loud. Oh my gosh. Uh, I just, can I just uh, make sure I'm looking at the right numbers here? So for the North Quincy um, <coughs> project, you're, we're going with the, the lowest bid of the three here, which is the 1,314,000, right? That is for the boiler work. Right. And then to that, we have to add the 330,000 for the domestic hot water. And then on top of that, the estimate that we're going for with uh, the Kennedy Center is the three and a half. Correct, is three, that correct? 3.55. So the math, and this isn't me complaining, I'm just curious. The, the math adds up to be more than the bond amount that you're asking for. And so I just want to under, again, I can't add, right? But I've just never, this is great, right? You're 
estimating a lot more than what you're requesting. So I just want to make sure that you, we had these conversations, right? These are things that need to get done. And I know that you um, hold yourself to, you know, these standards of making sure they get done, they get done under budget or at budget, et cetera. And you're asking less than what's being proposed. And so I'm curious as to why I'm not complaining. No, I'm I just understand. Curious. Um, I, I appreciate that question. Uh, as I did start out with, we did it previously, the council appropriated a million dollars towards the North Quincy High School project. So there is some funding available of that, uh, that can go towards it at this point in time. Mm -hmm. That full million dollars is not available. Uh, and thank you for asking the question because that's what prompted me to remember this. Um, also in that $7 million CIP request previously was to do the roof and windows of the North Quincy Fire Station. And our estimate was $680,000. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the scope of that was to remove and reinstall the existing rooftop units and the air conditioning ducts and all of that ventilation equipment, um, which we really took a look at it and we were paying a lot of money to take off 30 year old equipment and put it back on mm -hmm. uh, equipment that was already somewhat problematic for us. Um, so the decision was made to remove and replace the air conditioning and the ventilation system for the fire station to include, um, improve the quality of the ventilation and improve the air conditioning. It's a very, very difficult building. When it was built, it had no insulation. And the extreme swings of temperature inside has really been problematic for my department and, and very unpleasant for the firefighters who do work there. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, expectations have changed. When the building was built, uh, it was a large bunk room where they all, all the, the beds are, are uh, set up. And whether it's snoring or whatever else, it, it's uncomfortable in that condition now. Uh, so we've been asked to, uh, to petition off and basically make six small bedrooms in what was the large bunk, bunk room. Um, that is gonna cost, it's also caused a redesign of the proposed air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. Um, if you go by, we've got Shantytown, we, in the, in, in, we say that jokingly, but the accommodations in those trailers are actually very nice. The, the, the firefighters are, are pleased with them. Um, so we, we had to move them out of the building to do all of this work. Uh, so me being me, I'm like, well, if we get them out of the building, we've got the place ripped apart, we're going to abate this building. So we've abated every bit of asbestos that we know of in, those, in that building on top in, in first floors. Mm -hmm. All the while, leaving the apparatus available, leaving the kitchen online, and transferring the, the, the administrative and the response systems to the trailers. Um, you know, nine bedrooms, nine speakers, nine cable connections and whatever they are. So we brought over computers, we brought over the internet, we brought over the Wi-Fi, we brought over the, everything. That all costs money. So part of that original appropriation that was going to go to North Quincy High School, but we knew it wasn't enough, we did a shift and, and we're covering the cost of these added costs at the North Quincy Fire Station. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining again. I know that, um, you know, you've had to be very flexible um, with this work and bringing on another project manager. We talked about this during the budget, right? That it's helped tremendously. And so I appreciate that. I know that whatever timeline you're holding your team to, you're going to do your best to meet it and likely share the same frustrations when you don't. But um, no, I do. I just, I saw again, the, the final number here and it's just like, that's never happened before where people are requesting less, but I appreciate your explanation. And um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Harris. Mr. Chairman, um, obviously I ask my, uh, I, I support this, so obviously it's in Ward 6, both, both, both of the projects that I've mentioned. I appreciate what the administration did, how you've maneuvered in order to uh, get to this point here now where we, we need to approve, uh, approve it. Um, uh, our kids, we, take, we have to take care of our kids, and of course the Senior Center is a vital, vital part of not only the whole city, but I, I was glad to hear that we're, we're gonna be branching out and having other senior centers, but uh, that senior center really, really is right, right there in, in the uh, heart of, um, of um, Ward 6. So thank you, and I, I ask my, uh, my fellow counselors to please, uh, colleagues, to please support it. Thank you. Question on the motion, Council Mahoney. Paul, just you know, I'm going to I'm going to say yes to this, but but my brain just blew up when you just said that we used a million dollars that we had set aside for something else. Because when we do these bonds, 
it really should be tied to the project. So we should know before you're coming back up that you'd like use money for something else because it's not transparent. I'm going to keep saying this word transparent because, you know, I have no idea. And we've had these discussions before. I'm not going to say no to a school fixing, fixing their, their water heater or to a senior center that if we don't do this would have to close down, I'm assuming, right? Correct. So, so I'm not going to say no to that. But my head just basically, when you went through, I, I wish you just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to be transparent. Yeah, well, you're not being transparent, though, because you're yeah, coming up here I, and you're saying, because the way you're not being transparent is that we can't find, if you didn't need more money, we would never know about it. And that's not transparent. So when we give this money to you and we ask for projects to come back before us and have an update, and it's something that I get really frustrated with because I have you come up and you tell me all the projects you're doing, but you don't tell me what we're spending it on because we don't have that. That's never transparent. But you just did it tonight for me, so I kind of appreciate that. Um, it bums me out tremendously, though, to know that we've, we bonded money specifically for things and we didn't get it done. And it wasn't we didn't get it done because you started the conversation with, we didn't get it done because it's costing more than we thought it was going to do because the money escalated. But really what happened was you were working on a different project and you used that money to finish that other project. That's Maybe it did escalate. Maybe it did escalate, but it certainly didn't escalate until after you used the money for something else. And that's, that's, and, that's and, not you know, an and, accurate and statement. Four point, your, the math adds up to actually $4.9 million and you're asking for four point five. So I'm assuming that you have at least a half a million dollars left over. Correct. Okay. To your well, earlier statement, it's not the full million dollars that went to the fire station. So here's the thing. You can tell me what I'm wrong about, but you're the one who brought it up here and said that, you know, it escalated, the prices escalated, and that's why we can't afford to do this, and this is why we're up here asking for more money. And I, what I was getting from that, because I wrote it down going, oh, so we really only need $700,000 for the boiler. But no, we need the whole thing because... Um, because we used the money that we put aside for the boiler for something else. And that's, that's the part that's frustrating. And that's the part that's not transparent. You were transparent because you came up and told us. But, you know, I appreciate that. Um, but it should be more transparent to the taxpayers at home in the city of Quincy. Because we have other projects that are not getting done that I'm always going to be, I'm always going to be that person. Because when you say yes to this money, I expect the projects to get done. And when they don't get done and you have to come up and ask for more money, the question is, why aren't we getting these projects done? So that's... And I'll leave it with that because I'm going to say yes to this. So we're just going to, we're going to stop, okay? Because okay. I appreciate it. So I'm going to stop. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other counselors? We have a motion on the floor. Councilor, President DeBono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, Commissioner Hines, thank you for all your hard work on these projects. Um, this is going to be great for the boiler replacement over at North Quincy High School in our schools and in the, over the Kennedy Center for our seniors. Now, is this project going to start over the summer while the kids are not there? Correct. And will it be completed by September? It will not. The boilers will not be done by September. Okay. Uh, we worked in uh, coordination with the school department. They have relocated summer programming that would have been at North Quincy High School, and they relocated the food service program that would have been operating out of North Quincy High School. Um, and there's another one, too, that's been moved out. Because it's a two-pipe system. I don't want to get into too, too much technicality. Sure. But in order to replace the boilers, the entire system has to be drained down, so we can't run the air conditioning. So we bought temporary units to do the administrative offices, which are occupied all summer, so they can work in comfort, but the building would not be. Uh, in addition to that, we have to take down the electrical system for about eight days um, to replace the main switch gear in the building, uh, which is in danger of failing. So it was just easier and better to get everybody out of the building. Uh, but the boiler plant itself, the domestic hot water will be done for September so that you walk in and turn on the faucet, you can wash your hands appropriately. But the boilers will not be done. The target date for that is mid-October, okay. and that's really when our heating season begins. Well, thank you for your plan. Put it in motion. I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other counselors on the motion? Seeing none, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Yang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Chairman Phelan. Yes. Nine members. Okay, that is the last item that we have on the committee. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the Finance Committee. Motion has been made to adjourn. Finance Committee's adjourned. Thank you all.
I'd like to reconvene the Quincy City Council meeting. It is now 9.25 p.m. Uh, Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda, please. Number one, 2023-026, an order designation of polling places updated. So, um, if I may. Go right ahead, Ma uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. So we have a motion made by Councillor Harris. I'm going to allow the, um, uh, do I have a second? Seconded by Councillor Andronico. I'm going to uh, allow uh, Madam Clerk to proceed. Go right ahead. Thank you, Council President. I just wanted to um, give an update to you all that um, Ward 1, Precinct 3, um, which was at Quincy High School, uh, will actually go back to the Thomas Crane Public Library at 40 Washington Street. Um, we are in so many of the schools now that um, the the school administration has asked us um, if they could use Quincy High School for their professional day so that all of the teachers will go to Quincy High School on that day um, for their professional day. And um, Thomas Crane Library was good to us and um, certainly fits um, Ward 1, Precinct 3 there. So uh, we'll go back there. Ward 1, Precinct 5, um, which we tried to put into the Atherton House School, um, had some problems logistically, um, trying to retrofit it for ADA compliance. So um, we were working with public buildings and um, there was more work to be done than um, in, a, in the timeline to get it done for August and, and November. So we asked um, Father Martin if we could go back to St. Thomas Aquinas Hall, which he was happy to have us back. So um, we're gonna go back there. And Ward 5, Precinct 1, um, which was um, the Fort, Fort Square, is gonna go to Lincoln Hancock, it's right behind it, and we feel that that's a better fit than having three precincts up at the Southwest Middle School. So there'll be two down at Lincoln and two up at Southwest. Just fits um, better there. So um, those are the changes. We'll certainly make um, arrangements to have um, notice sent out to Ward 1 um, and um, Ward 5, Precinct 1. So motion made by Councilor Harris and seconded by Councilor Andronico. Any discussion on this motion? Um, just I want to thank uh, Madam Clerk for all the hard work on this. Um, we've moved around with um, Atherton and Howe a little bit with the ADA compliance, and we went back to St. Thomas Aquinas Hall, which is great, and then um, moving the uh, Quincy High School back to the Thomas Crane Public Library, and then and Precinct five, one, um, Ward one, 5, Precinct 1, Lincoln Hancock, back to the, um, um, to allow that to be kind of close to where it is. Um, you know, we, we, we're also talking about also postage. We're going to get all, all out to all the... Uh, uh, polling stations as well, Madam Clerk? Of course, we'll have new signs made up and uh, we'll have signs on the old places, we'll have signs at the new places. We'll be sure to um, put it out on social media ahead of the elections and um, QATV. And um, this will be in effect for um, this year and next year as well for the presidential um, elections next year. And I might add that if there is a preliminary election, so it's going to be August 29th, it'll be um, obviously before Labor Day. So putting these into motion, getting these polling stations out in the proper postage and letting folks know would be great. Thank you so much, of Madam course. Clerk. So motion made by Councilor Harris, seconded by Councilor Andronico. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Council failing. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Nine members. Nine members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Number two, 2023-055 in order of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3, Compliance Plan. Are we going to refer this to committee ordinance? I'd like to uh, call on Council McCarthy, our ordinance committee chair. Um, are we I, looking to put this in committee? I thought we could move, move this move tonight. It. Okay. Uh, if we could, <laughs> unless um, we have, oh, it has to be. Uh, hold on one second. I'll, I'll uh, Chief of Staff, Mr. Walker, if you could go right ahead. Through you, Mr. President, um, I believe it was the <coughs> solicitor's uh, intention 
uh, to have this filed this evening and then heard next week um, as part of the, the, the meeting next week and, and provide a little bit more detail on it. Essentially, this is a, okay. this is a box check measure okay. uh, in accordance with the state the state's new law relative to transit oriented housing but i think that the solicitor had a few words he wanted to say on it um and was planning on a presentation as part of the last meeting before the summer thank you mr wagner you would let um council mccarthy would you like to refer that to yeah. ordinance yes sir so i'm going to get a motion made by council mccarthy to refer to ordinance and also advertise to have a second seconded by council liang any discussion on the motion Seeing none, all, the, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. We're going to move that into ordinance and have that advertised. Um, Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda. Number three, 2023-056, a gift for $3,450 for Vera Stone Estadia. Motion to approve made by Council Harris. Seconded by Council Andronico. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Andronico. Yes. Council Kane. Yes. Council Devine. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President DeBorna. Yes. Nine members. Nine members in the affirmative motion carries. Next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Number four, 2023-057, a gift for $12,691. Motion to approve made by Council Harris, seconded by Council Andronico. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Andronico. Yes. Council Kane. Yes. Council Devine. Yes. Council Harris. Council Liang, yes. Council Mahoney, yes. Council McCarthy, yes. Council Phelan, yes. President DeBorn, nine yes. members. Nine members in the affirmative. Motion carries. That it completes our agenda items, Madam Clerk? Yes, it does. Yes, thank you so okay. much. Uh, approval of previous meeting minutes of May 15, 2023. Motion to approve made by Council Liang. Do you have a second? Seconded by Councilor Kane. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Those are approved, those meeting minutes from May 15th. Communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any traffics? Yes, we do. Um, to refer to Ordinance Committee for Advertising, Ward 1, Council McCarthy, add tow zone 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. on the west side of Quarter Deck Road, add no parking on the east side of Quarter Deck Road, add a tow zone 12 to 6. You want to waive the, we're going to leave it in the committee. If yes. you don't want to just waive it, you're going to go through all those. You can if you want. <laughs> if you want to waive the reading. We'll waive the reading. Um, waive the reading. Yeah, we're going to waive the ahead. reading. And what this is that uh, we're looking at a lot of no parking down in, in Germantown, but we want to leave it in committee and take uh, a relook and maybe go street to street instead of do them all at once. So we're going to leave that alone, leave that in committee. Okay, we're going to leave that in committee by uh, Councilor McCarthy. Um, any other yes. traffics or any other things? Go right ahead. Um, right Councilor Kane, traffic at a stop sign at Reservoir Ro at Road at Myopia Road, at a stop sign at the intersection of Forbes Hill Road and Stony Bray Road. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Any other communications, Councilors? Unfinished business and proceeding meeting. Moving on, reports of committees. I'm going to start with Public Works um, Committee Chair, um, Council Harris. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. There was two meetings held this evening, 2023-009 uh, uh, and uh, that was uh, grant the location, National Grid, Willis Street, Furnace, Furnace Ave, and Rusciutti Drive. That is going to be staying in committee. Uh, then uh, we had 2023-054 utility grant location for Eisen Old Colony Ave and Bale Street. Positive recommendation from the uh, Public Works Committee. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Council Harris. For the second. Second by Council McCarthy. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Nine members. Nine members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Um, any other Councilor Harris? Any more? That's, That's it. it. That's it. Okay, we're going to move over to Finance Committee. Uh, Councilor Phelan. Okay. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, at this time, remove from committee the appropriation for the fiscal 2024 fiscal budget. The final budget comes to uh, 
5,691,061.060.51. That we made we made a cut of uh, ninety three three thousand uh, dollars. Two amendments. One one added two thousand eight hundred and two dollars, and the other was five hundred sixty five dollars. That was that was added to to things that were type 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 or mistakes in the budget. So at this time, I would like to make make a motion to approve the fiscal FY 2024 budget. So we have a motion made by Councillor Phelan for the FY 24 budget to approve. Do I have a second? Seconded by Councillor Harris. Any discussion on this motion? Uh, Council, Mac uh, Council Mahoney, you have the floor. Go right ahead. Thank you. So I just wanted to explain, um, I'm going to be not supporting the budget. And we did do the salary reviews earlier. And I'm just, I, I, I do believe everybody deserves a raise um, that works for this administration, that works in all the department heads that do the work. I just think that the disparities that were shown in the way that they did this, um, it's really gender biased. The way they were doing it, it's not fair to everybody in the way that you're gonna get your raises. And the other thing that's really bothersome to me about the way we're doing our budget is just truly not transparent. And it was brought up during those salary reviews that it is, it's a known fact that we pay for people in other pockets of money throughout our city, whether it's opera funds, whether it's an oversight fund for, um, for Granite Links, whether it's CBGB money, whether it's the DIF, whether it's anything that they can pay somebody out of. It's not transparent. We do have in our budget a Discover Quincy project, and that gets paid for out of hotel motel, and it's offset. It's the same thing that you could do with all of these other salaries that we're paying people. We don't even know when they're when people are, are on the budget or when they're taken off the budget, because one of the salaries that we're reviewing, the person resigned in in March. But the point of the matter is, is that we don't know who's working in the city of Quincy and how they're being paid. That's a transparency issue when it comes to our salaries that we're doing i truly do believe there was some real disparities of what we're doing and it's just not fear of how we were going about doing that there are people that are at the lower levels that are not getting paid what i think would be a fear and and honest salary that they should be bumped up to and there are people at the very highest salaries that just doesn't it's just not justif justified as far as i'm concerned so that's why i'm not going to be supporting the budget thank you any other counselors Councillor Phelan, I just want to thank you for all your hard work with this, putting the, the nights together um, into three nights, um, moving the nights around based on the councillors making it, uh, your commitment and dedication to uh, the finances. A lot of extra work. I think a lot of folks don't fully understand that um, the finance chair has to put some work in and, and set aside time to meet with um, the auditor and the, and the city clerk and myself and, and Jen with the, the clerk of committee. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's behind the scenes to get these meetings in order and f figure out a, a schedule. So thank you so much. I know you're going to be uh, leaving us here in the council um, as finance chair. You've done a fantastic job with the budget and, and, and steering it in the right direction and moving it forward. So I, I want to th personally thank you so much for everything, um, um, Councillor. Um, and with that, do we have any other? So we have a motion made and seconded. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Council Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Eight members. Eight members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Budget is approved. Um, uh, any Mr. other, Mr. Any Mr. other Chairman, finance? Go right ahead. Yeah, we got, a, we got a few. We got a few more. Go right ahead. Okay, I'd also like to uh, move. 2023-47 appropriation for the 2024 sewer enterprise budget and that is 29 million 216 968 dollars and 83 cents motion made by councillor phelan do i have a second second seconded by councillor harris um in discussion on this particular motion seeing none madam clerk please call the roll councillor andronico yes Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes, we made an amendment. We added 80. Okay. Councilor Phelan? Yes. 
President DeBona. Yes. Eight members. Eight members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Councilor Phelan, go right ahead. Okay. Um, next, 2023-48, the fiscal 24 water enterprise budget. And that is a, a, a number of uh, 20, $23,864,153 plus 83 cents. And we had an amendment that again was a problem with the typographical error, which we ended up putting in for $88,181 that was added to that budget. Uh, so I would like to make a motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Council Phelan. Seconded by Council Devine. Any discussion on this particular motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Eight members. Eight members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, next item. Earlier tonight, we had a meeting on the capital, capital improvement plan. It's for 4500000 for public buildings. Um, there's a firm vote, of, vote from the council. It's item number 2023-49. I would make, make a motion to approve. Motion to approve for the public buildings appropriation. Um, I have a seconded by Councilor Harris. Any discussion on this particular motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Nine members. Nine members of the inferno. Motion carries. Okay. And one Mr. more. Mr. President, ahead. my last one. Go right ahead. Ah, uh, 2023 50. The appropriation of 13965000 for the Furnace Brook Golf Course, Golf Club, and Forbes Hill Park improvements. Uh, at a meeting held earlier tonight, it was a positive, positive recommendation from the Finance Committee. I would like to make a motion to approve. Motion to approve for the Furnace Brook uh, for um, uh, the amount um, and seconded by Councilor Kane. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. I'm sorry? No. Okay. Council Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Tabona. Yes. Seven members. Seven members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Any other agenda items? Not so. Any yet. other things pulled out? Any other committees? Moving on. Presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Uh, I'd like to recognize Councillor Liang. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, brings me so much sadness, like deeply, just personally, professionally, to uh, share with folks that two weeks ago we lost. Uh, Eugene Welch, who was the uh, CEO of South Cove Community Health Center for 23 years. He had just retired um, at the end of the last year and had passed uh, suddenly two weeks ago. He was just a force to be reckoned with in the community. I mean, he, he you know, was at the helm um, at South Cove Community Health Center when it started in Chinatown, Boston, serving folks, uh, particularly um, from the API community, so Chinese, Vietnamese, Cambodian folks. But really has grown the organization um, to be a community health center for everyone, right? And including folks um, from all walks of life who, you know, um, came to any community with English as a second language. Um, the, you know, health center now operates in five different locations, one of them being here, uh, right here in Quincy. And every year they serve over 30,000 residents. And that was no small feat and is just a snapshot of what he's done for the community. He's supported folks um, personally and professionally in their, in their growth and development when folks had wanted to get involved in the community and figure out ways to give back. And, and he was always somebody who was willing to pick up the phone um, and help regardless of what the matter was. It wasn't just about growing the health center. It was about genuinely creating a space um, that gave back and served the community. And I think everyone that he brought into that organization um, had to meet that standard that he set and we're all better off for it. And it's just it's a tremendous, tremendous loss to the community. Um, I know a lot of folks here um, had interacted with him, and so I know and I'm, I'm not alone in saying that it's um, a deep loss to all of us and a deep loss to, to all of us in the community here in Quincy. Um, but, yeah, he was a giant. Uh, whoever comes next is definitely going to be large shoes to fill, but he was, 
he was incredible. And I just want to um, make sure to, you know, if we could take a moment to um, extend our thanks to his family and his team for walking, you know, through a really tough transition when he had left. But um, even more so now, I think it's going to be really hard for folks to keep on uh, with the important work when trying to deal with this big loss. So just keeping, you know, his family, his friends, all of the, the staff and workers at all of the different five um, community health centers, but particularly the one here in Quincy. Um, if we could just keep him in our thoughts and offer any support that we can along the way, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the counselors? Just like to say, um, it's been an exciting week. Um, we've had the uh, police memorial um, this past week. Um, we had Quincy High School graduation as well as North Quincy High graduation. Um, and then we also had the fire memorial um, at the cemetery as well as the Flag Day Parade, uh, which was our, uh, our 72nd Flag Day Parade, which was phenomenal. Um, with all these events that happened throughout the city, it's been an unbelievable experience to be able to walk in front of Central Middle School, come down and see the big flag, the American flag up, um, that's, as we walked down, there was all the flags. Um, the street was paved, the sidewalks were done, the lines were striped, um, and then we had a nice, a nice night up at the, uh, even though it rained a little bit, we still had the nice night up at Pageant Field, which was done over. To see uh, the remarkable transformation of Quincy has been unbelievable. Um, um, to tailor off on um, Mount Wallison Cemetery, um, we've used right outside here for the Hancock Adams Common for the Memorial Day Parade. And it's just been, it's been an unbelievable scene. Uh, I, had, I had someone step aside to me and said that was a little negative about what was going on in the city in the last couple of years. And they said, ah, I went down to Kilroy Square. I, I can't believe what you guys have done to the city. Um, and they were up at Pageant Field this, this, this week for the, uh, um, the 75th Coke, um, Coke Club. Um, and she couldn't believe it. She could not believe um, how clean and how nice the city has become. So um, I know sometimes we hear a lot of negativity as counselors, but there are some really nice things that have been coming about in the city, um, just looking out the doorway. So kudos to all the different departments that have done such a great job with the city and making it look nice. The Flag Day Parade was just uh, over the top and, the, and then the fireworks, we got them off. There was no fires this year. So we did a pretty good job with that. And, uh, I know a lot of the other counselors were involved in a lot of the events through the week, um, and it's been a, it's been a great uh, a little ride for the week. And here we are at council meeting here on Monday night. So just want to say thank you to all the counselors that were involved in this and everything that you've contributed for uh, a lot of these events throughout the week. Um, any of the counselors? Seeing now we're moving on to motor motions, orders, and resolutions. Scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. So, counselors, we're down to our last meeting, which is Tuesday, June 20th at 6.30. Juneteenth is Monday, so that's a holiday, and we'll be convening here for our last meeting of the, of the, of the before the summer, and then we won't be reconvening until um, September. Motion, Motion to adjourn made by Councilor Kane, seconded by Councilor Andronico. All those in favor say aye, and we are now to convene our meeting at 9.49 p.m. We're now adjourned. <laughs>